Over to you, Jamie. I'm going to screen share and we can get started. Yes. Well, welcome everyone to this session by Lisa on developing thought leadership as a product manager. Uh, when I was first asked to uh, moderate Lisa's session, I had already seen Lisa's talk before and I got super excited. I couldn't help but uh, accept the um, request. And uh, we have a very exciting session going on today. Um, but first of all, I'm going to introduce Lisa. So Lisa is super passionate about promoting women in product and women in tech. Um, she was a former VP of product herself. So I'm, uh, you know, this is why I aspire to be one day. Uh, currently, she's an entrepreneur. Um, she is um, running this uh, coaching and development program. Um, and, you know, one thing I really remembered from her talk before was that she talked about climbing Denali and it was really hard um, and used that as a analogy for us uh, women in product and women tech on how we could use, use lessons she learned from you know, her mountain climbing in our career. And that was super inspirational. You know, that, that really stayed with me. I remember it. And whenever I have a challenge, you know, I think about Lisa and what she talked about overcoming challenges mm -hmm. and getting inspired. Um, and, you know, there, she's going to have an amazing interaction challenge at, uh, that I will kick off tomorrow. That's free for all of you to join. So if you're free this weekend, um, to, you know, definitely take takes an hour a day or so. Uh, definitely walk, um, encourage you to try it out. With that said, uh, Lisa, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you so much for the great introduction, Jamie. It's so exciting to be here. And um, Jamie's talking about Denali, which is behind me. It's part of the identity for Career Climb. Uh, as, as Jamie mentioned, I am the founder and the main coach there. And what we do is we help you identify and vision and really climb um, the best career mountains for you. There's so many mountains we can climb in the world and in our career, but we only have a limited time in this world and in our life. So let's take advantage of that, shall we? So today's blender, the agenda is that I'm going to walk you through a specific structure. And it's very, very important because the concept of brand and thought le leadership is a very fuzzy one, has a lot of interpretations. So we're going to get it to be very specific and very applicable to you and your career. So I will share with you a roadmap for managing your professional brand intentionally. I will help you understand the critical importance of managing that brand, because if you don't understand that importance, you're not going to do it. And then I'll share with you the two aspects, the two, the two avenues of managing your brand. And for each one, I'll give you several strategies and I'll show you how you can start using them immediately. And of course, the most important thing is I will in, I help you envision what can happen if you use the strategies I give you. Plus, as Jamie mentioned, I'm we're running our eighth iteration of the Product VP Challenge. Uh, that is an experience that is going to go deeper into the some some of the concepts we covered today. Really help you envision your uh, career, your future, not just the next you know six to twelve months, but really the next five years. And it's really for anybody who has at least uh, four or five years of work experience. You don't have to be in product; you can be in a product related field like program management or analytics or product ops. And um, you can also be, you know, an individual contributor uh, or a manager. We've had everyone from individual contributors all the way to VPs of product who've taken uh, the challenge and benefited from it. So head over to productvpchallenge.com and, uh, and signed up. Uh, we'll kick off tomorrow. So let's, let's talk about why today's topic is important. Uh, this article in the Harvard Business Review came out just last month, and it was part of a, um, an analysis of how successful women sustain career momentum. And momentum is an important word. I love momentum because by the law of physics, when you're in motion or an object is in motion, it tends to stay in motion. And when it's in at rest, it will continue to stay at rest, and it's really, really hard to get it to move. So one of the things that they highlighted in this article was the um, importance, not just of the personal brand, 
but look at this, the clarity around the personal brand. Because most of us walk around, we're very reactive at work. We're doing the things that are expected of us. We're accomplishing things that we're being tasked with and we're meeting deadlines. But most of us don't understand how we are perceived and also don't understand where we want to position ourselves, right? So here they say 83% of the women interviewed said that, um, having clarity on purpose and brand management was critical in maintaining their career momentum. So there's two components of this, um, you know, being aware of how others perceive you, but more importantly, and this is the focus of today's workshop, is how you can have an active input or an active hand in um, positioning yourself in um, the areas and the fields um, that you want to be seen as a thought leader in. So I want to see in the chat right now, and I'm going to go over and make sure I can see what you're writing, but I want you to drop in the chat your definition of influence. All right, so head over to the chat and drop your definition of influence. What does influence mean to you? Quickly, uh, since I'm going to want to cover a few more definitions, definitions. I want to see what does influence mean to you? Just don't worry about, you know, having a textbook definition. What does influence mean to you? What does influence mean to you? Come on, it must mean something. Okay, Virginia says the ability to convey or persuade someone or something. Okay. Kimberly says convincing senior leaders that your ideas are right. Interesting. We'll talk about that. But yes, right with parentheses is appropriate. Yasmin, affecting change decisions. Okay. And a person that can be heard and have people listen and follow. Interesting. So yes, somebody who it, whose voice is not just audible, but also received. I like that. R uh, Richa or Richa um, says bringing people along to a new ideal or vision, convincing them to invest their time or resources. Yeah, so there's an element of enrollment here. Influence is about, you know, affecting change. Catherine, inspiring others to do something differently. Yeah. Jamie, ability to sway decisions. Uh-huh. Achieving as a group says Noi. And Beth says you can drive change for the better by aligning cross-functionally and move the needle positively for the business or customer. Okay, that's a mouthful, but I totally get what you're saying. Uh, Ninika can pursue others and take people with. Great. Michelle, someone people trust. Aha. Trust is an important word. And you'll see that, you know, trust is trust is one of those things that's built over time. Um, it takes a very short time to break, but it takes a long time to build. All right. Next, drop your um, definition of brand. What does brand mean to you? And by brand, I mean more like a personal brand for you, your own personal professional brand. What does it mean to you? What is your definition of brand? What is your definition of brand? Yasmin, what you are known for. Sweet and simple. Uh, Rashmi, who you are. Ah, is it though? Is it who you are? Uh, very, very interesting question. Phil philosophical question we can discuss for a long time. Michelle said, how people perceive you, your values, motives, and goals. Yeah, interesting, Michelle. Like, would your own values and goals be the same as pe people perceive them to be? Another interesting philosophical question, right? Jamie, the reputation that precedes you. Uh -huh, yeah, okay. So something that you know, is outside of you, but maybe you don't have uh, full control over or um, can exist outside of just you yourself as well. Kimberly, top keywords that others would say when asked about you. Top keywords. Okay, I see. So the, um, the words that come to mind when you're being mentioned. Fong, Fong says it defines you. I'm not sure what you mean because I would take I would take issue with the fact that your brand defines you, uh, but that's that's a very very interesting um, definition. 
Richa, who I am as a person, personal or professional, again, I think we need to distinguish. I think it's important to distinguish between who we are and how we are perceived. Uh, it goes both ways, right? Um, sometimes, um, you know, we think we're better or more expert or more, you know, stronger in a certain area, but we're not perceived to be that way. For most of you, for most of my clients that I work with who are mid-career women in product-related fields, the reverse is true. Uh, we're sitting in our heads and we're thinking that we're not expert enough, we don't know enough, and yet others are already starting to perceive us as experts and as knowledgeable. So it cuts both ways, but it's not necessarily about who you are. There's a distinction between your own perception of yourself and your brand and those of others. Uh, your value prop says Catherine. Uh, yeah, this is like a, uh, you know, Catherine, I would say you have a marketing mind. <laughs> You're kind of USB or kind of what your value add is to those around you because, you know, everybody thinks about themselves and the world is not centered around you. The world is centered around other self centered individuals who, you know, <laughs> look at you and look at like what you bring to them or what you mean to them. Um, Tara, reputational work ethic, ethic. Okay. So this is Tara, you're somebody who I assume is a hard worker because you attach a lot of value um, to work and specifically work ethic. Um, and we'll see if that's a requirement for brand, but thank you for bringing it up. Junie, how others perceive you versus how you perceive yourself. Uh-huh. Sabrina, what people associate with you. Mm -hmm. Jin Lin, your specific skill set and abilities. Amanda, what people say about you when you're not in the room. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a, a common definition. And overall professional identity you might, you might have or aspire to have. I love this distinction that it's not the brand that you now have. It's where you're looking to go. As Wayne Gretzky says, Skate not the, where the puck is, but where the puck will be. Um, Ninika helps you in standing out in a crowd. That's very true if you own it and understand it. Uh, you hope it's your value prop. Yes, Amanda. Great. Next, uh, drop your definition of thought leadership in the chat. What is thought leadership to you? Drop your definition of thought leadership in the chat. What is thought leadership. It's one of those things that you don't know how to define it, but you know it when you see it. So let's try to define it. What does that mean to you? And then we can wax poetic on whether chat GPT can have thought, <laughs> thought leadership or not. So what is your definition of thought leadership? Let's get a few definitions here. What is your definition of thought leadership? Kimberly, a firm point of view about a topic, especially about something new. Yeah, so opinion, right? Firm means like, yeah, you have you have a position, point of view. Jamie, a strategic way of thinking associated with your brand. Okay, okay. So there's a connection there with some perception about you or um, kind of the brand that you are. Yasmin, having a validated opinion. Oh, interesting, Yasmin. Who is going to validate that opinion? And do you need uh, the opinion to be validated to have thought leadership? Junie, standing up for what you believe and having an influence in the community. Okay, so this is about courage, courage to voice, you know, an opinion and stand out. Virginia, being an influential person who can change how others think. Aha, uh -huh, so you're actually recognizing the power of the word le leadership within the phrase thought leadership. It's actually not just about having an opinion, but also influencing and um, swaying the perceptions of others. Noi, expression of ideas that influences. Mm -hmm. And Yasmin, now great response. Okay. <laughs> All right. Natasha, leading people to think the way you do. Oh, interesting. Look at how, do you see, I hope that everybody is watching in the chat. It's an interesting social experiment. You can tell, I can tell a lot about you already because you're showing your assumptions in the way that you define certain things. So interesting, leading the way, leading people to think the way that you do. Is that necessary for you to be a thought leader? 
That's an interesting question. And I think thought leadership is synthesizing theory through influence by conveying the practicality aspect that becomes relatable to people. I'm having a hard time understanding what you're saying, but I think there's a relatability aspect here um, and influence. Okay. Ninika, thought leadership is to empower pe people around us. Yes, it could be. But I would argue that that's just the definition of good le leadership, period, not just of thought leadership. Yeah. Awesome. And finally, drop your definition of strategic thinking. This is one of those buzzwords that, you know, uh, when I first started working with women in tech and really helping them get a, get ahead in their career, and we've had amazing results, you know, over a, a million and a half in <laughs> raises and compensation um, adjustments and new roles and all kinds of amazing things, including, you know, somebody started their own company and then recently sold it. Um, but some of the things I've always been asked is, oh, I've been untold, develop strategic, strategic um, thinking. And how do I do that? How do I demonstrate that? So what is strategic thinking um, in your definition? Give me your opinion of strategic thinking. And you'll see everybody's going to have different takes on this. Michelle says, thinking that goes above the tactical, how will we do it? Thinking big and taking a longer term view. Okay, so there's the component of timelines. So it needs to be longer term than just the tactical execution piece. Um, I like that. So tactical versus like long term, big picture. Kimberly, ability to make a plan that makes sense, leverages the strengths and opportunities to achieve a goal. Okay. Okay, so this is about planning. This is about planning and having a vision. Like, how are we going to get to the top of the mountain? Where are we going to go? What makes most sense? Um, okay, for uh, Jamie says, formulated an educated opinion on how groups of people, organizations should evolve over several years. Okay, uh, yeah, this is like the head of the um, the bank or like a big econ <laughs> economist. Yes, so like looking. Super macro view, super macroeconomic view. Um, that may be part of it too. Yeah. Noi, always refining the narrative of your goals and how you will execute them. Refining the narrative of your goals and how you will execute them. Interesting. And what is the time frame of the goals? Does it matter? Could it be the goal that by the end of this week, I'm going to walk 10 miles? Or is there something about the goals that makes them strategic versus tactical? Ninika, um, securing the current state and thinking ahead for your growth and optimization. Current state and thinking ahead of your growth and optimization. Okay, what are we optimizing towards? How do we know that we're optimizing and we're not just cha cha changing and walking in place without going anywhere? It's a question for you, Ninika. Amanda, creating educated reasoning and frameworks for making decisions and planning. Creating educated, okay, so backed up with data, uh, reasoning, frameworks for making decisions and planning. Okay, so this is about sys sys systematizing decision making, which is strategic, I agree. There's a planning component. Virginia says being able to identify and visualize the big picture and ways to achieve the end goals. Being able to identify and visualize the big picture, ways to achieve the end goals. Yeah, so kind of envisioning the summit and then having an idea of what are the different routes we can take to that summit. Catherine, being able to connect the dots, connecting tangible and tactical things to bigger picture concepts. Yeah, that's a bridge a lot of people struggle with, right? Um, oftentimes, we'll either have a conversation about super long-term big picture and other times super granular, granular and uh, tactical. But that bridge is really hard for the human mind to actually do. And I'll, you know, I help you with that in our product VP challenge, as well as in our, you know, group group coaching programs. That's the toughest, the toughest connection to make between the day to day executional and the longer term kind of big picture, because they're they're actually in different parts of your brain, um, and they're not easily connected unless you work at it. Beth says, ability to see and plan for the future, looking beyond the now. Junie, 
evaluating opportunities long term that will benefit the business as well as the customers. So it's interesting. Jun Juni is thinking of strategic thinking only as it applies to you uh, working for a company. Interesting assumption. And <clears throat> analyzing and planning for the long term success. Analyzing and planning for long term success. Okay, so there's a an element of reviewing current data and analysis, and then looking ahead. Yes, and planning for the future with known and unknown variables. Ah, that's an interesting one. We can have a whole different discussion of what do you know? Like, is it better or is it more um, helpful to know what you don't know or to don't know what you know or to don't know what you don't know? Um, by a robust plan emerged through research data and proof of concept. I'm a little confused by that, Nenika, but okay. Sophia says the ability to navigate and anticipate delays in the plan and adapt accordingly. Okay, great. So I hope that you can see from all of these definitions that there isn't one right way of thinking about all these concepts. We each bring our own interpretation to them. We each bring our own assumptions to them, we each bring our own context to them. So really give yourself the permission to own, to own, that's how you develop thought, uh, thought leadership. Give yourself the permission to own your own definition of these concepts, right? Your own way of looking at things. All right. So I'm going to quickly walk you through how I accidentally built a thought leadership brand when I was, you know, working in tech and coming up in tech as a product manager. And, um, you know, I kind of had a career, uh, I was fortunate enough to work for some hyper growth companies and startups, quickly ascending to VP of product. I had plenty of industry transitions, and I stepped into bigger shoes. Um, and so I kind of didn't have a choice, I had to build the confidence and reputation to catch up to the responsibility that I was being thrown, uh, that I was being thrown into in these high growth companies. I also didn't have a lot of mentors in tech. Um, honestly, I wish I would have killed for women in product. I would have killed for career climb and our community back then, but I just didn't have anyone. And so I had to figure it out alone. Uh, so I wanted, I was craving feedback and validation, but didn't know where to get it from. And so here's what I did. Uh, I was an early contributor on Quora. So this was over a decade ago. Quora was big at the time. I started writing long form articles and presentations. It just helped me organize my thinking and helped me uh, flesh out what I was, I was learning. Oftentimes my brain would hurt because I would be learning at such fast rates that I would need to put it down on paper to kind of process it. And I started writing, um, you know, on platforms like the Open Ideal platform, which was something that was set up for graduates of my business school uh, by a professor who was one of, you know, the two most famous Harvard professors, uh, Professor Clay Christensen. He has since passed away, the author of Innovator's Dilemma, Innovator's Solution. But then he invited all of us alumni of his class to get on this platform. This is after we had graduated, we were already working and really contribute, contribute our thoughts, our perspectives, our research, uh, which FYI, very few of the alumni did. I mean, he probably invited a couple of a thousand alumni of which only about 100 to 200 were actively contributing. So this kind of shows you the leverage that you can get by being one of the few creators out there. I started writing guest blog posts again on things that I was, I was learning, I was discovering, I was breaking down products and sites. And then I ended up being interviewed for some articles and books, including getting my own chapter in Cracking the PM interview. So this has all happened because I didn't have an outlet. I didn't have an outlet to kind of learn and see how much I was growing. So this is what I did. This was my way of growing. And then the results from me developing this brand accidentally was that I started getting a lot of incoming career opportunities. In fact, you know, I can't remember the last time I applied for a job, even when I was still working at tech, because I would just get pulled into new opportunities. It was a great recruiting tool for me uh, to actually build in product teams, especially in companies where I didn't have a large brand name, company brand name um, or budget to piggyback off of. 
I got started to get invitations to speak on industry stages. Uh, I mentioned my collaboration, Professor Christensen, again, of the couple of thousand people he invited to collaborate, a few hundred of us did, and then he invited three or four of us based on kind of the articles and the research, not, it wasn't even research. It was very, very easy. And it was, it was interesting. Um, then he liked some of our articles and then he invited a handful of us to come to Boston and actually collaborate with him on this piece um, that was in the Harvard Business Review and where I and the other couple of collaborators were being credited as being thought leaders. So there I was uh, within a few years of starting my career in product I was being named as a thought leader in the Harvard Business Review um, without actually intending to. And, uh, you know, this was this showed me the value of doing all of these things that I was doing just on my own um, and how much more effective and how much more um, impactful it would be if you do those things intentionally. Um, and, you know, Career Climb was actually launched uh, off of off of a talk that I gave at the first virtual women in product conference back in 2020. And um, so thank you women in product for that. So drop in the chat. I want to hear um, why are you actually here? Uh, where have you seen a need to develop said influence thought leadership or your brand? Was it a manager that mentioned to you that you needed to do that? Did somebody say something? Did you read something somewhere? Did you see somebody who had a brand and you decided you wanted one? What is your reason for actually spending your time here today on this, on this workshop? Why are you here? What do you want? And why is this topic important to you? Why do you want to develop it? So let's see if you... <clears throat> okay, Shuba to attract opportunities. Yep. Beth, strategies for expanding circle of influence and brand. And says, I'm trying to transition to product management with a brand angle. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone else? So I see that a lot of you are intuitively sensing that, you know, having a, a thought leadership and a professional brand. This give you a lot of freedom and opportunity. Um, all right, to learn. Okay, let's see. Um, Rashmi says, I'm here. Uh, the how does the world see you as a thought leader when you have hundreds of articles every day on social media? Huh. Okay, interesting. Okay, so that's more of a question. It's like, okay, like, do I need to write hundreds of articles to be seen as a thought leader? What is... What is this rat race and why, like, can it be one? This is what I'm hearing you say. Um, Junie says to learn tactics that I can apply to my life and work to grow in my career. Okay, so this is smart. You're actually seeing that this can be um, beneficial. This could be a lever for you to grow and rise in your career and get, get better roles and higher compensation. Yasmin, improve influence of work and network. Okay. Richa, stuck in a big company, coming back from maternity leave, trying to figure out what's next. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Ninika, currently working as head of product. Uh, would like to see myself as CPO in three to five years time. Ninika, um, a lot of what I'll be talking about will be highly relevant to you, especially the advanced strategies I'll be sharing shortly. Jinlin, uh, broaden my view on PM. Okay, so this is more of like, educational or like you're you're checking things out uh, Virginia after recently being laid off I'm sorry to hear that Virginia I thought I could would be able to transition to a new role however it has been very challenging have lost my confidence as a leader so Virginia I want you to um I want you to kind of um do a little bit of a of a mental exercise to separating separating your um uh, your uh need to find your next job and next role, which is, you know, very urgent. It's important. Separate that from um, trying to mix it at this stage with building your brand. Building your brand is a marathon. You'll be doing that over the course of months and years. Right now, focus on uh, pursuing warm leads and leveraging your network to land that next role, right? They're related, but they're not the same things. I don't want to give you 
um, I don't want to say, oh, build your brand and then get a job because those are very, very different timelines. That makes sense. Uh, eventually move to a consultant, says Amanda. Amanda, that is where that is where the freedom is. That is where the independence is. That's where the money is. I love that plan. Uh, and yes, you're right. You need to be visible. And you also listen for the advanced strategies I'll be sharing as well. Catherine, need to influence organizational change in the new role at a new company. Aha. So you want to be more effective. You watch out for the strategies. I'll be sharing the first batch of them. Ariana, I like getting asked to do cool stuff and being known by people. Doing cool stuff helps me make that happen. Yes. Ariana, Ariana is like a She's uh she's uh she wears multiple hats. She has multiple talents, and uh, she thrives by being in motion, and so that's part of her brand. And um, she likes to be with the cool kids. Michelle, wanting to build influence and gain recognition as a trusted expert in my field. Okay, so there's an element of trust. There's an element of your field, and we'll distinguish because your field is not everything to everyone. So you have to be comfortable to specialize, right? Natasha, a uh, recent grad, however, three, four month internships already completed PM jobs. I love product and still feel I'm really lost in how to express and form opinions and learn to be more sure of myself to create opportunities for myself. Okay, Na Natasha and everybody else who's got less than four or five years of experience, listen up. The most important thing you can do right now is uh, hit your wagon to a team, to a manager, to a company that is doing cool stuff and soak up as much as you can. Right now, you, it's not it's not the time yet for you to be processing and organizing the stuff that you're seeing already, although you can start doing that. But super, super important for you to be in the middle of all the action where the interesting things that are that are interesting to you are happening. So you can actually be on the mountain, on the terrain, learning things, right? So super, super important in the first, especially five years of your career. Nina, currently working as the founding designer at early stage startup, been mostly working in startups my entire career and never had a PM. <laughs> Nina, congrats. You're a PM as well, obviously, not just a designer. I've been doing a lot of product work too. Yep. Think about what exactly I want to grow into more product or design. Good news for you, Nina, is you can call yourself whatever you want, be a hybrid of both and make up like a role or a world uh, word. You don't have to put it, don't be like, put it on your resume or anything like that. But talk about your role the way that you want to see yourself. Envision your role the way it's going to be in five years time, in 10 years time. What are you going to be doing? Chances are there's going to be some combination or merger of those two things that you're doing now, or it may even evolve into something else. So I love that. I love that you're like looking at it and you know, what can I create? What is the role I want to create for myself? Sophia, I want to work in product management. I saw problem space in music publishing and working to develop tech dream solutions. Okay, okay, okay. Strengthen the muscle to share and teach rather than uh, just learn and do. Okay, Rachana is actually uh, is, is, is introducing a very important concept that I'm going to touch on shortly, and that is the difference between creators and consumers. The biggest shift that is happening in this world right now in this information overwhelm and data overwhelm space is that most of us are too busy responding, reacting, and consuming very, very few of us are intentionally creating the space to create. So yeah, learn and, uh, learn and do, learn and execute, listen is one mode that your brain goes into. But Rachana, you're very, very right. Those of us who are going to own our, our um, careers, who are going to own our, our future are going to be the creators. And we need to be training our brains to be creating and not just consuming. All right. So here's, uh, here's something that I heard from my own uh, clients as, you know, here's what they, um, they were being told, uh, you know, by their, their managers, by their uh, bosses, by people in their, in their company that they needed all these things in order to get promoted, in order to get more visibility in their organizations. So, right all the things that you had mentioned in the chat as well. Um, so now, because we're running short on time, I'm not going to prompt you with that, but just think in your mind, um, I think of like, okay, so you want this thing called, you know, thought leadership or personal brand. Uh, why don't you have one yet? Is there something that stands between you and having that already? 
Is there a challenge or something that stops you from having it right now? And here's what my client said. Um, it's a lot about, you know, being alone or feeling alone, no, but nobody to help and do it with hard to motivate myself, uh, not knowing what these concepts mean and how to actually do them. Um, you know, being discouraged by writing, submitting speaker proposals and then failing and giving up very quickly. Now, perfectionism, perfectionism is the biggest monster. Watch out for perfectionism. It is really, really really toxic. And so all this perfectionist and like writing and speaking is a muscle that needs to be developed with lots of lots of lots of practice. And you can't practice if you're trying to get perfect at every single time you do something. People will laugh at me. So a lot of impost like fears and doubts, I will fall off the bandwagon. I have imposter syndrome. That's huge afraid to present my ideas while the people don't like them. Who am I to talk about this? Who will listen to me? I don't get any feedbacks. Hard to know if I'm doing well, yada, yada. My, I have an accent. My English is not native. All this stuff, okay? So why, why are we here? What happens? I, 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 will, I actually have thought about this a, a, a lot. And I think the way that we work has evolved to where the needs of the future work are different. So back in the 20th, uh, back in the 20th century, we had lifetime employment. Uh, you stayed at the same company for the whole, you know, your whole career. Promotions and career man advancements were functions of your actual contribution. And uh, you probably worked with the same cast of characters for many, many years. So everybody knew what everybody else was capable of. The first 20 years of this century, we started transitioning now with the advent of the internet and technology into more, uh, it's more and more common to see kind of the average work stint becomes two to four years. And then there's this emergence of the professional brand online, but no guidance or no understanding of how to grow and manage it. Post pandemic, since everybody kind of was um, hyper, um, hyper thrown into the, um, you know, everything online, uh, we're actually entering a space that I believe will transition to us being the CEOs of our own career. And whether that means freelance or you having a portfolio career model, um, it will probably be more and more common uh, to be kind of, you know, a contractor or an expert that has, um, you know, short term, short term projects with, with companies. Um, and you can see that, I mean, with the layoffs that are happening right now, that's kind of how co companies already operate. They're like, oh, okay. They start treating their employees more like contractors than full-time employees. They're like, okay, this, th this year we have huge demand pandemic next year. We'll just get rid of a bunch of people. Right. So we're already starting to enter that model. And as I mentioned before, as we're doing that, the information is uh, overwhelming. And so one of my uh, classmates, who was a former VP of product at Yelp, once shared the data with me that fewer than 5% of Yelp users actually write reviews. And this stat is true everywhere you look, all the social media. And I'm not talking about social media because like a like or a comment is not really creation, but you know, a longer form post is or a blog post or an article or something is... Um, you know, very, um, uh, you know, very, um, uh, very similar in the sense that only three to 5% of people um, actually create, everybody just consumes, right? So that, um, that both is very, is a sobering thought, but is also a great opportunity for you if you want to join that three to 5% group. So there are two paths that we're going to be talking about. One is kind of what I'm going to ask that every single person on this call commit to, and I'll give you the ways to do it. And the other one is the more advanced version. Um, so, um, well, actually, before I get there, there's two ways to currently kind of develop a professional brand that I've seen. And one is to be an influencer. The other is to be like a, a narrower expert. The influencer, the objective is to gain followers and the expert is to connect with the right, uh, right people. Influencers best for early career. Uh, you see some, um, you know, product managers get gain huge followings on LinkedIn, TikTok. I mean, there's like one uh, one woman who is explaining lots of venture capital concepts while dancing in TikTok. Amazing, but she's doing that every day. Uh, and then the expert path is really there for you if you have 
had now some experience that you can build off of. Content, influencers, the shorter form, it's a lot of curation, a lot of information uh, and resource gathering, live videos, reposts, whereas the expert is longer form, less frequent, original curation and interviews. Again, the frequency is the biggest differentiator here. Influencer, you got to do it daily. You're on the treadmill. The expert, you can get away uh, with creating only a few things a quarter, maybe just as few as like one thing a month, just very, very doable. So that's the path I recommend. Um, and again, the influencer path has a different goal and the different set of requirements. And this is kind of my path that I took with all these like platforms where I've spoken and created content in my own podcast. You know, I'm currently writing a book. Uh, I have a, you know, I, I write a lot. I, I stopped, you know, writing uh, an artic uh, article on my LinkedIn newsletter. Now I just send it to my email subscribers. So if you want to get on my list, uh, go and join productvpchallenge.com after the challenge you're going to stay um, on my email list as well. So <clears throat> two, two strategies are we going to cover. Um, one, as I mentioned, I want everybody here to, to start doing ASAPs inside of the company. And then the, the bigger uh, or kind of the bigger game and the more visible one, the longer game is outside of the company, except for those of you that I said, watch out and uh, start implementing the advanced strategies that I'm going to be sharing. So what is the internal strategy, uh, the inter building your professional brand inside of the organization? What are the pros and cons of that? So as you saw, um, there's a very, very few, uh, there's a percentage of people who are creating is very small. So chances are that everybody in your company is just reacting, you know, trying to tread water in their bottomless email inbox and Slack, you know, threads. Um, so they're not really doing any proactive um, content creation and, um, and so it's easy to stand out. The benefit of you training your communication muscle by creating strategic content is that it, it, you will become a better speaker, you'll become a better writer, and that means you're going to become a better interviewer, storyteller. Uh, your uh, LinkedIn profile is going to look a lot more attractive. So you're going to get better opportunities and your career will benefit from it. The cons is that, again, um, kind of staying within the organization is your professional brand is not easily transferable or visible outside of that. But the people that you're currently working with will remember it. And so your network is going to kind of build over time. A couple of years down the road, you may reconnect with them again uh, in a new opportunity. So it's just a, it's just a longer, it's just a longer tale. So, okay, so here we're going to go actually through the things that you need to do to implement this internally. So the mindset, we need to switch the mindset from stakeholders are these obstacles that I have to do battle with. And the burden is on them to actually receive my message and allow me to do things. And if they don't understand or they don't support me, they're bad. Um, switch that mindset to, huh, you know what? Stakeholders are my audience. And it is my responsibility to learn how to talk to them in a way that they can hear me and in a way that they can engage with me. What do I have to say? Who do I have to be to land the message? What do I, how do I need to communicate to them? That's both format as well as timing. When do I talk to them about things? How do I bring it up? You know, lots of, lots of variables go in there. But once you start thinking like a marketer, um, the whole thing's going to shift because you are now going to be viewing your stakeholders as these ill, you know, meaning opponents you're going to be viewing them as an audience that you get to crack and you get to serve. So the first thing that you can start doing immediately is to streamline your communication. So very, very common is, especially if you're working uh, in a larger organization, is you will get somebody pass by your desk or drop in Slack or ping you one-on-one -on -one and ask you a question that, you know, word has spread in the organization that you have experience in answering, right? And so you go and you explain it to them. And then tomorrow, next week, somebody else comes up with the same question. Again, you sit there and you're explaining the same thing over and over again. So you're doing things one-on-one -on -one already. Uh, now let's switch that. 
at some point, I want the light bulb to, to, you know, shine in your head and for you to say, huh, you know, I've been asked this uh, like three or four times already. So I'm going to put together a workshop, a brand bag, you know, presentation. And I'm just going to go and do it in one to many format. Then we're going to record that video and put it on the company wiki, or I'm going to upload, you know, the handout and company wiki. And, you know, any, anytime somebody asks me that uh, question again, I'll just point them to that workshop recording and that handout. And guess what? Now you've thought a workshop. Now you are the expert on that question inside of your company have slides. Um, so here's the next thing. Get clear on your big picture strategic ideas. This, I've used this, I've used this because it helped me think through and organize uh, my understanding of a new product or of a new industry when I would, uh, you know, ramp up as a, as a senior product person in a new, in a new organization. But I, I really want you to stop Stop being oblivious about the big, big, big picture strategy of your company, product, the market, the growth vision. Uh, we'll talk a lot about this. I'll be sharing more specifics with you during the Product VP Challenge over the next couple of days. And FYI, it's not a huge time commitment. It's just like an hour call a day uh, for the next couple of days. Uh, but I really want you to snap out of this kind of like, oh, this is above my pay grade, you know, somebody else's job to figure this thing out. Even if you're an individual contributor and you're further down the food chain, I want you to immediately sit down and envision how you would run this business or product. If a genie were to come in and say, ta-da, magically, you're the owner of this company, what would you change? What would you invest in? Where would you see the opportunities, right? And then I want you to sit down and produce your actual strategy deck, deck of slides that talks about this. Imagine somebody's hired you to, you know, explain to them what you're going to do with this company in, in the future, in the next, you know, six months to five years. Where's this going? What is important? What's not important? What questions do you need to answer? Who has, you know, answers to some of those questions? And so, and share it with, as a, as a talking point, share it as a conversation starter, not as like, this is my vision, go and implement it. But, hey, I wanted to share my thinking with you. Can I sit down and show you a few slides? Powerful, powerful, especially if you're just coming into an organization, you're trying to get up to speed, uh, sit, sitting down and talking with the heads of the departments about this, for me, has been like the biggest single thing that I can do to build a, rep a reputation quickly. Next thing, package your ideas and propose them strategically. What does that mean? Okay, so <clears throat> email. Let's talk about email. So much stuff gets put in a Slack message email that really, really gets lost in the noise. You may put a great idea in there. You may put a request in there. You may put like an actual, you know, framework in there. You can have something really, really important, but by putting it in a, in an email thread or in a Slack thread, you're letting it drown in the noise, right? So I want you to identify the things that are really, really important that you're looking to communicate and actually pull them out, pull, pull them out of those no noisy channels, put them in a PDF or a series of slides, which will help you think through them um, in a more concerted way, and then attach them to the email or the calendar invite. Even if it's the same exact words, the fact that it comes in an attachment automatically elevates the importance of that communication to your audience because everybody gets email. They are conditioned to see email text as, you know, not important. PDF or slides, ooh, this is actually thought through. Somebody has put something important that requires me to open this thing and view it and consume it, and I can do that in a focused way. Build influence through aware presence. So instead of being passive in meetings with a conversation with more senior individuals and only speaking up when you know the answers, uh, having your camera off, multitasking, I want you to immediately, immediately, as if somebody is going to pay you, uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars if you do this. I want you to be present, be present for the meetings or the interactions that you have with people. Uh, be reflecting and ask clarifying questions instead of being worried about what you have to say and what you don't have to say, right? So asking questions is the best, best way to build the impression that you are actually <laughs> very knowledgeable because 
you are serving everyone else by asking clarifying questions that they may not have asked themselves, right? So you don't have to know everything. You don't have to be a know-it-all. You just need to learn and get in the practice of asking questions. Uh, becoming a curator of resources. So again, don't feel like you have to have the answer to everything yourself. Instead, start collecting useful resources around your domain, especially the biggest you know, topics that come up over and over again. And start collecting them in your like wiki or your guide or, you know, your name, you know, your name slash curate, your name apostrophe curated resources. This doubles as a great topic for a podcast appearance you can have or a blog post you can author. Curation is creation in this day of a, uh, uh, an age where we're just overloaded with information. Taking advantage of external existing uh, in existing internal channels. So right now you may never volunteer to speak at or contribute to existing communication channels in your company like blogs, podcasts, brand bag series, all hands, etc. Stop doing that. Inventory those channels and start like saying, okay, I'm going to volunteer to speak at that, or I'm going to submit a proposal to write here, or I'm going to ask to present something in the all hands. Um, create your internal channels and events. This is the ne kind of next level. If your company doesn't have that, start one, start a brand bag series, start, you know, a blog, start a podcast, start, you know, some sort of like series that can be yours, that you can be the curator of, and you can invite everybody to kind of profile them on stage because you're associated with that. You'll automatically be elevated, um, you know, in the minds of everybody as somebody who thinks, you know, at a higher level. So if you commit to using at least two of the strategies that I shared with you right now, you're going to level up your communication. You're going to be tapped for opportunities to present and explain things. You're going to be seen as an expert just by association with some of those things and be top of mind with stakeholders. Amazing, right? So get your chat mode ready. <laughs> I'm going to summarize the approaches that I just covered. And I want you in the chat to drop what two approaches do you commit to me today that you're going to be implementing in the next week? So approach number one, setting up one-to-many presentation or brand bag talk for a question you get often from different people. Number two, outlining a strategy deck that you can complete in the next month and show to at least two people in your company. Put your proposal, notice I did, I did not say make a strategy deck from scratch to finish in the next week, just start an outline. Number three, put your proposals, arguments, ideas in a PDF attachment versus inside of the email body. Number four, in a meeting, focus on asking at least three reflecting, clarifying questions and listen. Number five, curate a list of top resources in your domain. You can also have one on every major topic and share those with people in company. Number six, inventory your company's comm channels and volunteer to create content for at least one. Number seven, volunteer to start a comm channel in your organization. So go. I want to see in the chat, which of these two are you going to be doing in the next week? Okay. Ninika is saying number two and number five. Great, great, great. That's a great choice for you, Ninika. Yasmin, two and three. Four and five for Jun Lin Noi, four and five, Michelle, four and five, Beth, two and four, Richa, four and five, um, Natasha, three and five. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And please go in the Women in Product group next Friday or next Thursday and um, and basically report, report which ones you implemented and uh, what was the result. Now, very quickly, we're going to just cover the external audience uh, strategy for those of you who are more senior and uh, more advanced and ready for it. Um, <clears throat> the pros and cons for an external brand building. Super effective as an emissary for you um, when you switch jobs or join new teams and networks that have no prior background on you. Again, that kind of emissary that precedes you. Great recruiting tool. Great recruiting tool if you're actually looking to attract talent to you as a manager. Cons are <laughs> much higher consequence than the internal brand building. Um, also, long form original content is permanently uh, online. It's really hard to remove. Uh, LinkedIn newsletter creation, for example, um, is currently limited to one per profile. And all your professional connections are automatically going to be invited to that newsletter. 
once you start it. Stakes are high to be on point and put out high quality content. Again, starting your newsletter. I did have that newsletter. I've since stopped doing it because my goals as a, as a, as a business owner and entrepreneur are different. So now I'm driving everybody to consume my newsletter and my writing in my, on my email list. Again, you'll get on the email list when you uh, register for the product BB challenge. Um, tech. Uh, okay. So stuff stack or medium are great for building your email list and monetizing it. Again, this is important for those of you who want to start their own consulting practice. Great, great, great tool. Start building an email list. Um, and LinkedIn newsletter is uh, currently, and because they're spending a lot of time and resources on it and they're profiling it, they're uh, really, really um, pushing those, the, those newsletters. Uh, but it's high consequence and limited to one newsletter per profile. So warning, you need to be an expert uh, in the sense that you need to have your clear goals and career plan and vision uh, before because you need to select one audience and have very specific goals. You need to do that very carefully. Um, submitting to speak at the industry events and conferences. Hello, Women in Product and other amazing organizations. Um, you know, just do it. Do it, do it, do it. Practice, practice, practice. Uh, if you want to just practice um, getting more comfortable, record videos regularly, post them, um, you know, in your newsletter articles or posts, this builds collateral. Again, you can just have a video inside of a newsletter article. Preparing a speaker kit, regularly submitting speaking, speaking pr proposals and pitches, especially for those of you at the VP level or above, senior director and above, and those of you who want to get into consulting. Get on podcasts. Um, you can pitch me to be on mine. Um, I have a, a, a female tech exec podcast or advanced start your own podcast. Really, 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 really advanced. I'm not recommending it um, to anyone here. What about uh, AI and chatbots? So, uh, you know, everybody's talking about uh, AI and chatbots. So what does that mean to you and, uh, and the strategies I'm outlining here? So according to Chamath Palihapitya, uh, the AI future will belong to companies that have proprietary data sets that can benefit from this AI. And for you as a, as a, as a person, the future in the man role, according to him, will be AI prompt engineer. What does that mean? That means that, you know, the value is going to be in navigating and managing um, the interaction with the AI. Uh, because garbage in, garbage out, like how you ask is makes all the difference uh, in what information or what, what data you get back from the AI. So by extension, your brand will depend not so much in coming up with new information or unique information, but it will start leaning more towards curation and the organization and inter interpretation of these endless seas of data. So... To have a strong professional brand, you must first be very, very clear on your three to five year career vision, values, and the topics that you're interested in being an expert in. In other words, which mountains do you want to climb? And also be very clear on your six to 12 month career plan. Now, only then will you be able to kind of figure out who your target audience is, figure out your leading theme, uh, set up your editorial calendar, content creation cadence, pipeline of topics, manageable daily and weekly tasks, yada, yada. Um, blocking time off. These are all the tactics that flow from that clarity and that vision. Only then will you be able to really like long-term build a very intentional uh, brand. That's it. Easy, right? Oh, wait. <laughs> Actually, if you want to go deeper and get help with that visioning piece and planning, I want you to go right now, right now to productvpchallenge.com. Uh, don't do the www because my I just transitioned to a new platform that's going to throw a security warning, but go to productvpchallenge.com, sign up. Um, and, you know, even if you can't attend the full challenge live, you'll get the ability to um, do re a replay and you'll also get on my email list that way. So with that in mind, we are uh, at the top of the hour. I know that there was a Q&A planned. We can take a couple of minutes for Q&A if there is an additional Q&A. Otherwise, we can transition into blenders. I do see a couple of people lined up to come up to speak. So I'm going to bring you all up. Um, Nikita, I'm going to bring you up first. And then Suba will be um, showing up after. Oh, I... 
Not sure what's happening. Every time I pre press plus, they all disappear. Um, okay, if you wanted to come up to talk or ask a question in the Q&A, please go ahead and do now. Um, I, if I accidentally bumped you down, uh, come back up again, sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and it takes in the, a minute to enable permissions. So there may be some people coming up. Yeah. And I would love to know, I know that, you know, uh, the women product gap, and I have a survey, but it would mean a lot to me if you drop in the chat on a scale of one to 10, how useful and actionable and valuable was this um, talk to you. I do it in front of this audience. So that would mean a lot to me if you kind of give me a rating of a one to 10 on value. Great. Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> Thank you, Sophia. Um, awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got an 11. Thank you, Jen Lin. <laughs> My ego is stoked. <laughs> Jamie, are you having, um, are you bringing somebody on for? Uh, looks like I'm not seeing anyone come back up. Uh, it might be people may have to. Oh, um, oh, okay. So Ariana says the migration that. queue is not working. Yeah. All right. Yes. Feel free to ask your questions in chat or mm -hmm. go on to Q&A. But I do know um, some people may have to leave at one o'clock. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do have a question uh, in the meantime. Um, one thing that I really struggle with is finding time to do this. Uh, you know, um, I have a four-year-old that takes up all my free time and I'm barely getting work. Like all this stuff I need to stay above water done at work. So it's, it, I don't know how to find time to, you know, think more strategically and plan farther ahead. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, the truth is, if you ask, you know, any author or uh, so a book I highly, highly recommend for you and anybody else with the same question is called Deep Work. Um, and so Deep Work, the author, um, I love him. And, um, you know, he says you don't find time, you create time. Any author will tell you that. And the good news is that you work in time blocks. So you do have a space on your calendar, uh, regular, that you turn into a habit, that you protect at all costs. You do it usually earlier in the day before the tsunami gets a hold of you. Um, and whether it's half an hour, 45 minutes, if you do it consistently, you'll find that your output for that time will um start going up the more frequently you do it so right now i'm i've gotten to a point but i've been writing you know i've been writing and blogging and creating things and creating podcasts i have like over 130 uh, podcast episodes that i've created i can right now sit down and write a thousand word article in about a half an hour and i don't need to do a lot of editing but that's the result of me having done this consistently for years right so the hardest thing is starting because your output is going to be um you know small in the beginning but if you just stick to that time box and only do one or however many times a week you want to say like monday wednesday friday i'm going to do half an hour in the mornings this is my time i commit to it i sit down and if if i just kind of write two or three words i'm going to pat myself on the back and say yay you know, that's, that's, that's the output, because if you stick with it, that output is only going to go up. Quality is going to follow quantity. You can't shortcut that. That's why I say perfectionism is the worst toxic. It's like the toxic poison that will kill your career faster than you can blink. Um, creating content strategy. Yeah, Amanda. Um, Oh, there's, there's like lots, but basically um, the framework that I gave in, uh, in the slides about, you know, being clear on your market and your themes um, and then setting up the editorial calendar is a very tactical thing. There's a book called The Content Framework. It's mostly for business owners, entrepreneurs, and, and, and email content writers or, or you know, copywriters, but that's going to give you a little bit of a, of a, of a way to generate a ton of ideas. Um, yes. Also yes, Michelle, you can leverage content that you've put together before. What was that, Jamie? 
Oh, I was just going to point out that Michelle also has a question in the Q&A, which is, who are some women thought leaders who execute on these strategies well? Yeah, I think Deb Liu comes to mind um, as one. And if you read her book, she, you'll see that she would, again, she's, as a mom, has a lot of responsibilities, work the high stress uh, roles in Facebook, et cetera. Um, but she disciplined herself to write every day. And she created the time for that. Uh, another one is Charlene Lee. Charlene Lee, L-I with a, you know, Lee. Um, she's great. Uh, she's kind of had her consultancy for the last, you know, 10 or 12 uh, years. She's great to follow. Um, obviously, <laughs> uh, you know, yours, yours truly. Um, get on my email list and you're going to see like a different way that I approach things. Again, uh, I do share a whole lot, um, both on my podcast and in my email, my email list. So these are uh, ones that are specifically women, uh, women in tech, but there's a lot of guys out there and there's a lot of, uh, you know, authors, etc. The business school professors who write books on productivity and um, like Adam Grant, um, Nir Eyal Nir, uh, he's a collaborator of mine. I've interviewed him. He has like, you know, he's the author of Hooked, but he has like more writings on productivity. Those are great to follow as well. Um, great. Any other questions? Yes. In the Q&A, I see a question from Yasmin. You mm -hmm. built your brand on Quora and other platforms. Nowadays, do you recommend people build their brands on LinkedIn or that spreads or does that spread that out? Um, and which platforms? Yeah, link, link, LinkedIn for sure. So w when I was using Quora, LinkedIn was more of a, like a resume directory and they were just starting to build out LinkedIn recruiter as their main monetization uh, way. They were not doing any feeds. There were no influencers, no like long form content writing on LinkedIn. This is very, very new to the company over the last couple of years. So um, they're trying to compete. Um, they're trying to kind of own become like a media platform instead of just like a, a resume directory. Um, and I think they're having success with it because they have a captive audience. And so they're really trying to squeeze out Substack and Medium. Um, and they're pouring a lot of resources on it. And as I mentioned, they do send like, here's the crazy thing that they're doing with LinkedIn newsletters right now, which is like, it's just, it's just amazing. The kind of this distribution you get for your newsletter. Uh, when you start your newsletter, they'll email a solo email, a separate email to all your all your connections to say that you're starting this newsletter and you're inviting them to subscribe to the newsletter. Thereafter, anytime you post a newsletter article, they're going to email, send a separate email that says like Lisa Kostova via LinkedIn with the title of your post. They're going to open the email. They're going to have the full length of that article inside of the email with a call to action to go and engage with it on LinkedIn. But the truth is like this, you're, you're essentially creating a synthetic email list out of your LinkedIn connections and you get in their inbox with that LinkedIn <laughs> newsletter. And the open rates are pretty good um, on the LinkedIn newsletter. So your connection on LinkedIn may not be logging into LinkedIn frequently, but they still get delivered your article in full in their inbox every time you write. So you get a direct channel of communication with your LinkedIn connections and followers, which is like phenomenal. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to last for long. I actually think they're doing it to just like push super aggressively LinkedIn newsletters. Um, all right. Do we have other questions? Yes. Uh, there's a new question from Virginia. With respect to identifying your leading theme, finding your niche can be difficult initially. Yeah. What recommendations do you have for figuring it out? Yeah, so Virginia, if you go back to the slides, I, I'm, you know, I'll make the slides available. You can review them. But basically, it kind of all flows down from your long-term vision for your career, what you want to be doing in five years' time the types of things that you want to have your hands in, the types of technologies, the, the types of, you know, communities, the types of problems you want to be solving. And then you need to think of it as a marketer. Um, you need to start thinking about like, okay, 
in order for me to get to where I am now, to the vision I have for myself in five years, who are the, the people that I need to get to know who are going to be important for me to know who are going to help me get there. So for somebody who's trying to be um, have their own company, a startup in five years time, but you've never been an entrepreneur, you've never had that. Obviously, it's important to cultivate relationships with um, uh, other entrepreneurs, with that community and investors, right? So immediately you're like, okay, this is my audience. This is my audience. What can I produce in terms of insights, interpretation, curation that will interest them. So for example, oh, I want to I want to connect with the investor and entrepreneurial uh, community on, um, you know, let's say, for example, you want to build AI products, right? And so you're like, okay, who is investing in AI? Well, right now everyone is, but like, let's pick a different niche, like, um, I don't know, like healthcare or healthcare medical device. Like who is investing in that? You know, and how does my background and even though I may not have a huge background in that space, I can be the curator of interesting opinions. I can be the interpreter. I can be that person who surfaces relevant and interesting perspectives to my audience. And that's going to then drive, okay, I'm looking to create relationships with these individuals. Again, it's not everybody. It's just the individuals that are relevant for your future career vision. And then you then understand what it is that you need to write and talk about that this audience will be interested in reading or following you for. So it kind of works backwards. You don't arrive at your niche. You kind of start with your vision, understand who it is that you need to meet and develop relationships with. What are they interested in? And start writing about that. <laughs> so it's, like a, it's a marketing approach. Um, okay, I hope that helped. All right, um, should we do Blender breakout rooms? Yes. Uh, so as a last minute reminder, um, please fill out the survey. And yeah, Lisa and I will be joining the Blender. Uh, Lisa, is there any last closing thoughts you'd like to share? Yes. Join me for the Product VP Challenge tomorrow. Even if you can't make it live, I, I promise you it's going to be worth it. ProductVPChallenge.com. And, right. and remember, in a week's time to report in the, um, in the uh, Women in Product group, uh, what strategies did you end up imp implementing and what was what were the results that you saw? Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you over at the networking event. Bye. So well, welcome, everyone, to this session to build thought leadership as a product manager with Lisa. Uh, so a quick introduction about myself. I'm a senior product manager at Fictive, which is in the online manufacturing space. Um, and Lisa here, uh, I first knew of Lisa at a woman in product um, conference a couple of years ago, saw her talk and was very inspired by it. So uh, when Ariana and Rachel asked if I would moderate uh, Lisa's session, I just jumped on it. I was like, I got to moderate for Lisa. Um, so Lisa's super passionate about promoting women in product and women in tech. She's a former VP of product, which is um, a role I hope to get someday in the future, and currently an entrepreneur, which is amazing. Um, she's coaching and developing people. Um, and, uh, you know, there's going to be an amazing interactive challenge that she's going to kick off tomorrow that she'll tell you about. I highly recommend you all join it. Um, it'll be running for a couple of days and pretty low commitment. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing I just want to say is when I saw Lisa's talk a couple of years ago, uh, I, I, she talked about climbing Denali, which is a really tall mountain and the challenges that came with it, the toolkits. Um, and how to, you know, get motivated and face your challenge. And that really stuck with me. So when I do face challenges at work or in personal life, um, I think about Lisa and what she told us uh, around like facing challenges. Uh, with that said, uh, back to you, Lisa. Oh, thank you so much, Jamie. It means a lot to me. Um, you know, you see Denali behind me. It's the tallest mountain in the uh, in on in North America. Um, I'll tell 
I'll tell this the story about it at the next product uh, women in product conference. But you know, truly, um, the the thing I want you to take away from the session now is uh, your personal brand, your life, your professional brand, whatever you want to call it, is your unique mountain that you get to choose, and it doesn't have to be like any other mountain that everybody else is climbing. It gets to be yours. And there's going to be ups and downs and challenges. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. Like I was told by some mountain guides in Mexico when I was climbing the volcanoes there in preparation for this, um, this big, big ascent. So with that in mind, I uh, wanted to give you a, a sense of what we're going to cover this afternoon. I will be giving you a roadmap to managing your professional brand intentionally. And I'm saying intentionally uh, as a highlight. You will also understand the critical importance of that. Why is that important? Not just because it's a cool buzzword and maybe your boss mentioned that you should be developing your thought leadership or strategic thinking, but really understand why it is so important for you, for your career growth, for your freedom, independence, including financial independence. I'll be showing you two distinct um, avenues of managing your brand. One of them, I would like you to start implementing right away. I'll be giving you strategies for both. Uh, the other one is more advanced and will be appropriate to some of you or will be appropriate to you further down the line. I'll be showing you what can happen if you use the strategies I give you. I uh, really I really want you to take something away from this time together and apply it and actually see results. Um, don't treat this as another thing you watch with half of your brain while multitasking. Um, that is not going to be a good use of your time. So if you're distracted right now, if you're like, eh, you know, I have five things to do to do honestly go do those things right now um and then you know you can join us tomorrow for the product vp challenge which you can you know register for i'll give you the link it's actually productvpchallenge.com but honestly i just i want you to be here present paying attention because this is important this is one of those important investments that you're going to make in your own growth in your own personal pr professional um freedom and independence that um, that that are going to pay off if you're present and paying attention. So uh, as I, you know, as Jamie mentioned, we, I'm I am having the eighth edition of an experience. It's a free experience. It's very interactive. Uh, if you can't make some of the live sessions over the next couple of days, there'll be replays. Um, the community is amazing. So if you sign up at productvpchallenge.com. Uh, you're going to get all, you know, you're going to get the invitation. It's one hour a day starting tomorrow. And we're going to be covering a lot of the topics I'll be talking about today, but in a way more depth, just because we'll have more time. So let's start with why is today's topic important? So just last month, Harvard Business Review came out with an article, maybe you've seen it, about successful women who've maintained career momentum. And high on the list of factors that allowed them to maintain career momentum was this, epic clarity on your personal brand. I've highlighted it, and I've highlighted it not because it says personal brand, but because it says clarity on the personal brand. So many of us are reactive at work. We have so many things to do. Things are expected of us. We're given full plates of work that really we don't have the mental space unless we make it intentionally to stop and get clarity of where we want to go. How do we want to be perceived? What do we want our personal professional brand to be like? How do we want to be, how do we want to position ourselves as thought leaders? Where do we want to position ourselves as thought leaders? So what I'd like to do next is kind of an exercise that will be, uh, will illustrate to you and to me the various perspectives and definitions of some key concepts that we're going to be talking about today. So what, the first thing I want you to define for me, your definition, your own personal definition, don't worry about the right one, there isn't a right one, define influence to me in the chat. So uh, go to the chat and drop your definition of influence. What does influence mean to you personally? 
please don't go on Wikipedia and like copy and paste stuff from there. <laughs> We're talking about developing your brand. So be a thought leader and put your definition. Inspiring others, says Karen. Sheila says the ability to get people to agree with you. Interesting. So we have enrollment, inspiration. Um, having an impact on people, influence, says Bene. Um, and because she has a last French last name, I'm going to assume it's Bene as opposed to Benny. <laughs> Amy says other people making decisions based on their interaction with you. Okay. So we're seeing like influences about us being able to um, impact or cause somebody else to do something that they wouldn't have done without us. It's kind of being a catalyst almost. Um, so having an impact on people, making decisions based on their interaction with you. Priyan, she says, ability to convince and inspire pe pe people. So convince, interesting, interesting, convince. Now, um, it's an interesting question. Do you need to convince somebody to be of influence on them? How about negative influence or influence by example that causes somebody to want to do the opposite? Uh, my coach who trained me for Denali is a, a famous mountaineer. He's a Patagonia ambassador and personal friend with the Patagonia CEO. And he recently uh, broke up with his business partner and his training company. And uh, I was having a chat with him and he, you know, and I said, okay, what, what, what happened? He said, well, you know, he took most of the team left um, and then told me that by next month, this company is going to be closed. My company is going to be dead. And so I said, oh, then he make a mistake. Don't ever tell, uh, you know, a high altitude climber, alpinist that he can do something. It caused, you know, Steve to get into high gear, you know, work from 6 a.m. until midnight for two months and rebuild his whole company from scratch, right? So do we need to convince in order to be able to influence? An interesting question. Nay says, having people listen to your advice and having that advice have weight. Okay, so we're talking about like what you say actually can't, has the impact to be considered when weight in the consideration of others. Carrie, ability to change the course of other pe people's decisions. Again, you know, that catalyst image. I like that. Like, can you change the course? Can you change the trajectory? Ledor, Ledor Nubari. I love that name. Ledor Nubari says ability to lead people without authority. Mm -hmm. Or I would say maybe without formal authority or without formal kind of like the designated like, hierarchy. Megan, the ability to actively bring users along with you around your ideas. Bring users along with you around your ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that image. I'm seeing kind of like Megan, you know, collecting a group around her and rolling them in. People, not users. <laughs> I know the lingo, the professional lingo is seeping in. Benet, yes, it's right, Benet. I love that. Put the, the little... Um, um, accent marks. Grace, ability to achieve desired outcomes. Hmm. Ability to achieve desired outcomes. Grace, I can see that you're a high achiever and achievement is part of your vocabulary and that you're very single-minded and that you're somebody who can be an amazing and very strong individual contributor. Notice how you did include, um, you know, someone else in your definition of influence. Influence, you define influence the way I would define achievement. It's interesting, isn't it? We reveal a lot about our assumptions uh, in those definitions. Renee, a model that you want to follow. Interesting. Same thing as with grace. There's no uh, nothing here about somebody else other than the person who's you know doing the action. Jen, people coming to you for advice, coaching your opinion. People coming to you. Oh, interesting. So Jen is somebody. It's interesting. Jen. Jen actually admires somebody who you know, is, is, is leading without having to take the initiative, but is so respected and so well regarded that everybody just naturally comes to them, without them even having to say something. Jen, that's probably a style that you want to develop in yourself as a leader and a thought leader. Vanessa, influence, ability, able to convince others about a direction, someone who consults you and wants your point of view. Yeah, when your point of view matters, right? Swaying people's minds without them realizing you've done so, Benet. 
Yeah. Um, they may or may not. They may or may not, right? Um, quiet influence or subtle influence is what, is what you're talking about. Fantastic. I like that. And you see the plethora of uh, definitions and opinions that are coming through. Um, this is important. It's important for you to understand that there's a lot of different ways of looking at these concepts. There's no right or wrong definition. And also no, notice how much you can tell about someone's worldview and assumptions, not good or bad, just how they view the world um, through their definitions of influence. The next one, oops, uh, just look at the first one. <laughs> Don't look at the third one. Give me your definition of brand. Brand. What does brand mean to you? Your definition of brand. What is your definition of brand? Professional brand, personal brand, you know, your own brand. And we're talking about a professional context here, but what is your definition of brand? What do you recognize for, says Benet? Okay. Prianchi or values? Interesting, Prianchi. Now, brand, brand. Priyanshi, Priyanshi, I can see you're very, you give values a lot of importance. The question is, could you have a value, but um, have it in a way that nobody else knows about it, so it's not part of your brand? Uh, let's see. Ledor Nubari says, the first thing people think of you when they hear your name. <laughs> That's, yeah, association. Like, what are some of the qualities that stand out? Megan, the first few things people, thoughts people have when they hear your name, yeah. Mace, when somebody, what someone is known for, style in which the person communicates. Ah, uh -huh, style in which the person communicates. It's interesting. Um, yes, that may or may not be part of the brand, right? Uh, Renee, brand, which you're known for, can be good or bad. <laughs> That's right. Or let's put it in another way. You can like it or not like it because <laughs> there's no good or bad. I mean, there's just everything's like relative when it comes to perception, right? Yao, something you're known for. Qi, Qi Yuan, Qi Yuan or Qi Yuan. I think it's Qi Yuan. Um, just looking at like the name, because I know that Qigong is spelled with a Q. So Qi Yuan, I assume I'm pronouncing it. How others perceive you. Yes, yes. Um, Karen, the value you bring to others. I would distinguish that because like measure value in whose, in whose eyes. You may think you are bringing value to somebody. Let's say you were going to give a gift and you're a big tea aficionado like I am, and you give them an amazing green tea. Turns out that person is allergic to caffeine, right? So did you bring them value? You thought you did, but did they think you brought them value? So the definition of value, I think it's important in whose eyes or perception of value. Vanessa, our values and what we stand for attributes that may be tangible or intangible, one's voice. Yeah, so voice is not necessarily what we stand for. I think the values and, you know, our, yeah, the, the values and what we stand for is different. It has connection to our voice and it's all, you know, related to brand. Great. Thank you for that. Now, pl please define thought leadership for me. What is thought leadership in your mind? When somebody says, hey, this person is a thought leader, or when somebody asks you to develop your thought leadership, what does that mean? What is your definition of thought leadership? Bene, leading with expertise. Leading with expertise. Okay, okay. So if you lead with expertise, like, um, like a very experienced architect, for example, but you don't say or don't show it or don't bring it out there in the world. Is that a thought leadership? And how is that different than leadership? Just a philosophical question. Um, okay, so Priyanshi says, let's see. 
Uh, Priyanshi says the way you approach problems. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, yeah, how your mind works, but where does le leadership factor into that? You know, I see the thought piece. I don't see the, the leadership piece in your definition, Priyanshi. Sheila, valuable knowledge around the topic. Again, is knowledge sufficient? And in this day and age, especially with the emergence of AI chatbots, which we're going to address in a bit, I would argue that knowledge is commodity. Knowledge is free and is available to everybody. <laughs> Everything is able to be found these days. Valuable knowledge around the topic. How is that different than, you know, chat GPT that can give me that knowledge around the topic, right? Ledur Nubari, um, a reputable proven track record voice and influence in the Nari area. Okay, so you're bringing in a few elements. I like that. So track records, there's a, there's a track record of experience, firsthand experience. You know, we're just not book smart here. Reputation, which is built over time, again, through the practice. Influence in an area. So there's a little bit of a, there's a bit of a, an element of having a voice or actually bringing out some opinions. Tatiana says lead with their ideas. Tatiana, I assume you mean lead with your ideas, not with someone else's ideas. Uh, that's how I'll read this. Uh huh. Carolina says good communicator and expert in the field. So Carolina, a uh, good job on identifying the need to communicate. <laughs> Because you may have the best ideas in the world, but if you can't convey them to anybody other than yourself, are you really a thought leader? And the expertise is, you know, so a combination of expertise and communication. Vanessa, forward thinking in a particular domain. Mm, I like that concept of, okay, we're not talking about what's happening now, but what does it mean for what's going to happen next? What does it mean for the future? So the forward orientation is important. Renee is saying, having a perspective that helps others think differently, connect the dots, understand insights that may not otherwise, a perspective people want to hear or include. Yeah, perspective, point of view. This is how, how you are different from chat GPT and AI. You have your perspective. You, your, you know, your perspective, your unique way of interpreting it and of creating meaning from the sea of information that you see around you, connecting those dots in a way that's unique to you. A pundit, huh? Interesting, Karen, a pundit. Pundit, which I assume you mean by like somebody who um, is, you know, constantly kind of like thinking out loud, has like opinions on certain topics. Uh, Safina, teachable, learnable, lived experience, teachable and learnable, lived experience. So again, with Safina, like what you're fo focusing on is the actual experience. Yes, it's an important ingredient, but it is, is it sufficient to make you a thought leader? Um, or is it just a prerequisite? Rachel, being able to translate or highlight key aspects of something for a specific audience in a compelling novel way. Again, the idea of translation or the idea of curation, the idea of like, okay, I'm synthesizing, I'm interpreting, and then I'm able to package it in a different way that creates something unique out of commodity ingredients. I like that. Grace says, inspiring innovative ideas and ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. So you're not only bringing ideas, but you're doing it in such a way that inspires others to think differently. I like that. Great. Awesome. And finally, give me your definition of strategic thinking. You know, in my work with clients, I work with lots of mid-career and executive uh, women in product areas just like you. Um, you know, we uh, have these amazing programs that you know, I'm going to be starting one soon. It's called the Denali Executive Accelerator. But um, in that, one of the hottest requested topics for me to explain was, you know, the concept of strategic thinking, specifically around, you know, 
hey, my boss told me I should become more strategic. Hey, my boss told me I should develop strategic thinking and demonstrate it. What the heck is that and how do you do it? So I want to know what is your definition of strategic thinking? What is your definition of strategic thinking? Karen, understanding the playing field, being able to develop a plan to leverage the opportunities. Okay. Okay. So Karen, what you're talking about is bigger picture. Uh, I have this visual and we're going to cover it in one of the days in the product VP challenge uh, about the coach's boxes perspective. For a lot of us, when we're on the field, we have this narrow vision. We can see some of the players around us, but the coach from the coach's box from further higher up can see the whole playing field. And then they can think about strategies and ways of configuring the players in the field you know, for several moves ahead, right? So I like that visual, understanding the playing field, having that coach's box perspective and developing a plan or understanding, having some scenarios, understanding what we're looking to accomplish and what are some ways of getting there. Um, seeing the long, Megan says, seeing the long-term vision and being able to communicate that vision. Yeah, so there's a forward-looking perspective. And I love that Megan is the first one to bring the idea of long-time horizons. Um, that is definitely an aspect of strategy um, that is different than tactics or execution. Part of it is just what time horizon are we talking about? Um, because ultimately, long-term strategy needs at some point to get broken down into day-to-day -day tactics and execution. And there's that linkage between your day-to-day -day routine and your long-term goals and vision that I have found most women, well, most professionals struggle with when it comes down to their careers. And that's why, you know, I've developed the challenge, the product VP challenge. Um, and that's why I've developed like the Denali Executive Accelerator so that we connect those two. And you can start like executing on your vision as opposed to like having these things completely separate and disconnected long-term vision versus tactics and execution. Uh, Priyan, she says, planning and problem solving for short and long terms. Planning and problem solving for short and long terms. Okay, so Priyan, she, you're also bringing in the idea of connection between the long and short term. Binay, being able to articulate thoughts and ideas that fit into a strategy or direction. Yeah, so the concept of articulation, communication, again, somebody else brought it up earlier, is important as part of that. It's not just the knowledge, it's not just the experience, it's also the communication piece, right? Mace, how to set the goals to reach the long-term vision, how to set the goals to reach the long-term vision, how to stand out in the field and how to create a new category in the field. Okay, so Mace is actually bringing in, um, you know, the whole marketplace, the competitive field, like where do we fit in the bigger picture? Not just what do we want as a company to do long-term and where do we see ourselves in the five years, but where's the whole industry going to evolve in five years time? You know, what's going to be there that's not there now? Um, and that gets into some very interesting questions about like, which is better or which is, you know, <laughs> more risky, knowing what you don't know, not knowing what you know, <laughs> not knowing what you don't know. Um, so that's, that's, that's super interesting. So uh, Vanessa, connecting your ideas and direction to the bigger picture of today and where it can go tomorrow by combining, combining many sources of inputs with gut. Yes, so Vanessa brings an important um, element, which is intuition and gut. So uh, one of my, um, you know, a coach and a mentor, actually, you know, a whole different area connected more to copywriting and marketing, said that, um, you know, there's two types of intuition. One is a trained intuition and one is an untrained intuition. New, new, um, new people in the field always uh, first come with untrained intuition, which is, um, is, you know, you need to take that with a grain of salt because you don't yet have, uh, you haven't yet tuned it to whatever you're creating, whatever you're working. If you've been around the block for a while and you've checked whether your intuition was correct or not sufficient times to trust it, then that's called trained intuition. Uh, Renee, thinking analysis, planning of things in the future based on what you know today and assumptions, hypotheses you make and how you would go about maximizing the future, mitigate risk and increase likelihood of the outcome you want. Wow, Renee, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Somewhere in there, I think, is like thinking about the future and, you know, executing and checking and measuring. Uh, Amy, 
figuring out where we are, where we want to be and why and how we should get there. Ah, Amy, thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing the why. Why? <laughs> why? Why is such an important question? It is the most important question. It's the most important question that you can possibly ask. So many of us assume that people have answered that question before us. And now we're just operating on assumptions that somebody at some point has figured out the why. And now we're just making it happen without questioning the why. Um, Amy, I don't know if you're Gen Z, but uh, I have a few friends and clients who are super ambitious Gen Z. And I wish to choke with them. You're, you know, you've been put on this earth to ask the question why. <laughs> Of all of us older folks who, you know, sometimes are not asking ourselves this question enough. Love it. All right. So let's move on. I want to make sure I'm still sharing. Okay. So a little bit of my story of how I, very importantly, accidentally built a thought le leadership brand. The reason I am walking you through my story is that you understand that this is not a concept to me. This actually, this realization, this framework, uh, these observations that I'm going to share with you actually came out of my own experience. But I did not know what I was doing at the time. Uh, only with the benefit of retrospect did I realize what I had been doing. Um, and I want to present that to you so that you can actually do it more intentionally and get better results than me. So for me, uh, my product career um, was, you know, I got my start at Zynga when Zynga was teeny tiny. Uh, you know, one of the first, the very first product I ever worked on was Farmville when it was doing 32 million daily active users. And then I uh, quickly kind of uh, grew up in Zynga and then uh, became kind of head of product and VP of product of various startups. Um, in different industries. I did a lot of industry transitions. I switched from consumer to enterprise. I, you know, worked in uh, several different, you know, related and completely unrelated industries. And so every time I switched to something completely new, I had to start from scratch. And I was thrown into these big roles of responsibility. So I had to build my confidence and reputation. And because I didn't have any mentors in tech, because I was in these kind of relatively um, immature, early organizations where I was actually one of the older individuals at 30 plus, I, um, I had to figure it out alone. So I had to get that validation and confidence. I had to process the knowledge that I was acquiring uh, with someone else. So wanted to get feedback, but there wasn't anyone in my of immediate vicinity that I could do that with. So here's what I did. At the time, you know, Quora was kind of the platform for, you know, writing answers to commonly asked questions. And so I was an early contributor to that, uh, mostly around product management. I mean, this was before product school and Reforge and all these like gazillions of frameworks. This was before any school taught what product management is and how it should be done. Um, I started writing long form articles and presentations, mainly, mainly because I wanted to process my knowledge. I wanted to organize what I was learning. I wanted to see, to kind of extract some principles. I wanted, and I wanted to validate that what I had extracted actually had value to someone else. So Open Idea was a platform that uh, was set up by um, uh, a professor that has since, since passed away, uh, one of two of Harvard's most famous professors, Professor Clay Christensen, the author of Innovators Dilemma and Innovator Solution. He, um, in 2013, 2014, set up this platform as an experiment and invited all alumni of his class uh, to contribute. So he invited several thousand pe people to contribute ideas and articles and research on one of the topics that he was digging in at the time. Um, and of those, I think a couple hundred of us actually contributed articles and thought pieces. Um, and then he invited just like three or four of us to come to Boston and collaborate with him in more in depth. I also get, did guest blog posts. Again, same thing. I would see some, something would fascinate me. I would break it down and I would look at, connect those dots and look at how the principles that I had learned at work also apply to this thing. Um, for example, I wrote this blog post uh, on Nirayal's blog about an addictive auction site at the time. And I kind of 
broke down um, the methods that they were using that I knew from the gaming world. And I showed like, hey, here's how this thing hooks the person and here's why they're doing this this way versus that way. It maximizes profit for them. And I kind of like broke it all down. Uh, I was interviewed for articles and books, including uh, ending up with my own chapter in the Cracking the PM interview. Um, so Gail and Lakshmi found me on Quora. Um, and that came out of it. I ended up being in one of the books on, you know, product management, one of the early books on product management. So what are the results of kind of that uh, brand building, accidental brand building, putting myself out there, you know, organizing my thoughts, having an opinion, point of view, learning, sharing. Um, I started getting more incoming career opportunities. So uh, for the longest time, I don't think... I can't remember when was the last time I applied to a job when I was working in tech. Um, every time I was kind of pulled in from somebody else who knew of me or had worked with me into that company. It was a great recruiting tool because remember, I worked for startups and companies that didn't have a strong brand. So I was able to, um, you know, they were they were so impressed. They'd seen me and the cracking the PM interview. So they were shaking like a leaf when they would interview with me. <laughs> um but it, it, it was it was useful to kind of they wanted, you know, they wanted to come and be mentored and be um, and be on my team. Um, I started getting invitations to speak on industry stages. As I mentioned, I was invited by uh, Professor Christensen, who did like my articles that I submitted on the platform. Um, and we spent four days in Boston coming up with one of his new theories on actually financial uh, capital, capitalist dilemma, he called it. And so in the 2014 issue, I think it was like October issue of 2014, Harvard Business Review, they actually, there's my name there. And, you know, it's under the, uh, the header of thought leader. So it was a surreal moment for me to be, you know, to see my name in, you know, Harvard Business Review as a thought leader. Um, that, was, that, was, that was pretty cool. Career Climb, uh, which is, you know, which is my, my baby and my passion, uh, really has got an amazing community, produced amazing, amazing results for, for women in their careers. Um, it all got born because of this first speech I gave at the Women in Product Conference back in 2020, which gave me the platform to launch my own company. So um, drop in the chat very, very quickly. Um, why are you here? I want to understand what prompted you to um, want to develop influence, thought leadership, and your professional brand. Did someone say something to you? Did your boss say you needed to do this? Did you see somebody and get inspired by them? What is the reason that you are here on this workshop this afternoon? Um, okay, let's see. Let's see. Like, yeah, why are you... <laughs> Why are you not doing something else? Why are you not on Slack? Maybe, maybe you are. If you are, like, too bad. You're missing out on a lot of really cool stuff here. But um, why are you not watching Netflix, making dinner? Why are you not, you know, doing something else right now? So what is your interest in developing thought leadership, your brand, and influence? Why? Why do you want those things? Amy, I'm experienced my career and think I've had some good insights to share, but I'm blocked on what to share and how. Yes, perfectionist perfectionism, if I have to guess, which is the bane of my existence. Actually, our um, Denali Executive Accelerator cohorts, we co jokingly call our groups Perfectionist Anonymous. Uh, Benet, I took an extensive career break, three and a half years. Congrats, Benet. That's an amazing thing to do. Go traveling, having a baby. I want to get tools to promote myself and build on this to help me secure my next opportunity. Smart, 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 smart. I like that. So connection with the, you know, the idea of freedom, independence, and naming your own game and defining your own future. Super, super important. That was my, that's, that's, that's like a lot of my motivation as well. Jen, I have a lot of experience, want to be able to share it. What Amy said, Megan, I ended up getting, not getting a promotion again, because I continue to be told I don't demonstrate strategic thinking at 
thought leaders. So, Megan, welcome to the club. Um, you're not alone. This is like the standard excuse for being passed over for promotion. Um, and the reason why I kept hearing the same, you know, words over and over again. Um, so great that, you know, you'll have some, some tools to start attacking that. And honestly, I also want you to, um, to trust your antenna, like make sure you're picking up whether they're truly meaning that and they want you to develop that and they're interested in supporting you to develop that versus it being a convenient excuse that they copied and pasted from somewhere else and they have no interest in supporting you. Those two are very distinct. Carolina, I want to empower other diverse women in tech. Amazing. Karen, people tell me I need to work on building a personal brand so more people recognize me as a thought leader. Yep, yep, yep. Lador Nubari, um, new grad product manager, six months in, early in my career, want to grow to be a product thought leader, more organ beyond, blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, yes, mindset is important, but for you and anybody else here who has less than five years of work experience, the best and most important thing you can do is just throw yourself in the middle of all the action. Go to the companies, go to the organizations, work with the pe people that are doing things that are interesting to you. Make sure that your brain is hurting at the end of the workday from all the things that you're learning. Soak up as much as you can. Be a sponge. That will give you plenty of material to process afterwards and speak from direct experience as opposed to kind of regurgitate what somebody else is saying who has had that direct experience. So priority number one, five years or under in work experience, go get the most kick-ass work experience that you can get your hands on. Uh, Rachel, I love sharing knowledge. Want to do this in an impactful way that has a positive impact for people. Great. Build a presence in the industry. New one says Renee transitioning from fintech, big tech to climate tech. Yes. So growing industry, lots of opportunity there. My own processing knowledge acquisition realized things aren't synthesized in a helpful way for product people. That's right. Because climate tech has not traditionally been product led. Thinking that I can help fill this gap will also create a presence in the area and plan to be in the next 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. Renee, I love it. You already know what your desired domain is. You have the time frame of vision for 10 plus years. Really want to see you in the challenge and work with your vision uh, in the product VP challenge. So sign up if you haven't yet. Sheila, I'm really my career. You need to build my credibility. Yes, she, Sheila, for sure. The best way to build credibility is to be in the middle of the action, get some kick-ass experience. Glad to be part of the club. Ha ha. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jen, uh, to expand on that, I want to expand on existing brand. Okay. Vanessa, I'm very quiet on LinkedIn. See lots of people consistently posting interesting content. I've always loved writing from the heart. Yay, a fellow writer there, Vanessa, me too. Uh, but not sure what to do in the realm of career and feels authentic, not just self-promotion or robotic obligation have to. Beautiful, beautiful. So what I'll show you next will, will help answer that. Absolutely, you're right. Don't be a copycat. Don't do whatever everybody else is doing. Um, the social pressure, the perceived social pressure can be huge. So an internal thinker and processor says, Raquel, Ra 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 Raquel, I want to learn how to externalize more and build community. Yes. So the whole idea that we want to create, we want to be creators, but in this age of uh, information overwhelm, the vast majority of us are consumers only. So Raquel, yes, yes, for creative impulse. Rachel, I love this blog that breaks down the issue. Uh, the she is not strategic crap. Okay, um, we'll check that out later. Yeah, I've seen getting, I've been getting one-on-one -on -one feedback that I'm strategic. I want the larger community to know that. Awesome, Yao. Awesome. That's great. I had to apply for all my previous jobs. And it would be nice to be reached out for my next job. Yes, that will happen. Um, awesome. Let on, uh, let on nobody. Um, Mace, I experienced something similar as well regarding promotion at one point in my career. I also got the advice from a coach. I learned that it's important to be a thought leader in the space, especially as we move up. I'm in the health tech and tech bio field where we've worked on some innovative areas. Wanted to share my experiences. Yes. Awesome. Amazing. All right. Let's move on. Um, this is stuff I've heard over the last two years with close to a hundred professional women, just like you that I've coached in my accelerator program and in some of my other executive development programs. Um, it, it, you know, my company's competitive. The only way to get ahead is to market my work and present artifacts. I need, I was told I need these things to get promoted. 
need to be seen a strategic thinker. I need to know how to think strategically. I want opportunities to find me. Uh, we don't have time to do this, so I'm going to skip through this. Um, you know, I also asked the question of, okay, well, if you want all these things, how come you don't have them yet? What is the challenge? What is the perceived obstacle that's standing in your mind in the way of you already having developed this brand? And here's what stands in the way. Again, my uh, group of amazing women told me this, you know, I have to do it alone. There's nobody to help and do it with. Hard to motivate myself, stay accountable. I don't know what these concepts are or how to go about developing them. There's the failure. Okay, I just submitted once to speak. I wasn't accepted. I got demotivated and failed and gave up. I'm a perfectionist. Perfectionism is the biggest, most toxic thing that you got to overcome uh, if you want to be successful in your career. And I talk about it because quantity precedes quality. Everything that we do, just like riding a bike, speaking, writing, gets better and faster the more we do it, which means we need to start and we need to start making by making a lot of mistakes and getting things out that are not quote unquote perfect. You know, I um, part of the reason why I drove myself to speak so much and develop myself as a speaker is because I suffered from childhood stutter. I still still stutter. At times, you'll see me sometimes not being able to pronounce strategic, uh, I'm sorry, thought leadership. There's something that is hard for me to pronounce that specific phrase. But I persevere. I push through it. It gets easier and easier. Um, you know, I have more than 130 episodes of my podcast now. As a podcast host, I've been on other podcasts. I've had speeches, talks, workshops. It gets easier and more comfortable and I get more confident, right? So perfectionism is the thing to, to completely, completely get over. It will, it will sink you faster than tight Titanic. I promise you, you need to fight it. It's not anything to be proud of. Um, I don't get any feedback. It's hard to know if I'm doing well. Imposter syndrome. English is my second language. Hello, it's my third language. Um, I also have an accent. Again, if you set your mind to, uh, on something, if you prioritize it, you will get better at it. You will master it. So here's what um, the evolution of career models has uh, shown us very, very quickly. The 20th century was about lifetime employment. Same people you worked with day in and day out. And so you knew what everybody else was capable of and what, you know, the talents and the capabilities of everybody was. The first 20 years of this century, we started transitioning from lifetime employment to more like, hey, it's normal now to work between two and four years of the company. That's considered normal. And then with the proliferation of technology and um, the emergence of the Internet, now we have all this online uh, space to, you know, showcase our professional brand online, but there's no guidance on how to develop it. The next, the future, the next chunk of time is going, I firmly believe is going to see us evolving into more of a freelance model where, and you see companies are already starting to treat us like that. You know, um, they're so fast uh, to lay us off and hire us. They're so fast to hire us, you know, during 2021, 2020, when the pandemic kind of, you know, increased demand for their services and products. And just like that, they lay you off a few, a few uh, not even two, two years later. So they're already treating their employees like contractors. A lot of them are. Um, and that's going to be the future. You're going to be the custodian of your own uh, portfolio, of your own portfolio of work. And you're going to probably have contracts with companies um, and, you know, join them for projects here and there and then move on. And then it will be your responsibility to market yourself and develop your brand for that. So, Here's the good and the bad news. The bad news is that, uh, well, the good news is that only 5% of people create, and this number came from a classmate of mine who was a VP of product at Yelp, and he told me that only 3 to 5% of Yelpers uh, create reviews. Everybody else is just there to consume. Uh, the bad news is that if creation was easy um, and it was, you know, it was easy and there was a lot of free time to do it, um, that 5% figure would likely be much, much higher, wouldn't be just 5%. So there's two paths to creating a professional brand. Uh, the first one is going to be applicable to every single person here. The second one is only, um, for some of you, is um, going to take some time. 
And for some of you who are more senior or want to be consultants uh, in the near future is going to be appropriate sooner. Um, actually, b- before we go in uh, there, um, there's two ways that you can develop your brand. I have a strong recommendation for which one you should go um, once you see how I lay them out. So <clears throat> you can develop yourself as an influencer or as an expert. The objectives are different. Influencer just is all about numbers, gaining followers. The expert is not about the numbers of followers. It's about connecting with the right people. Um, Again, influencer is great for early career. There's a couple of PMs out there that are have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of views on TikTok. There's this one former LinkedIn PM that like she dances and she is explaining a venture capital concepts to her audience. It's really entertaining and there's nothing good or bad about it. It just is. It's a strategy. It's very different strategies with different goals and objectives. Uh, whereas the expert path is really more appropriate, I think for mid to late career, because by then you will have gained some experience. You'll have the ability to speak from experience as opposed to just lean on kind of that entertainment factor. Um, the content uh, for the influencer, it's shorter form curation, live video reposts. Uh, the expert is longer form, original plus curation interviews. The frequency is the biggest differentiator. Uh, influencers really, it's a content treadmill. You need to be there um, daily, very, very frequently. As an expert, you can be an expert and you can be, you can produce content as infrequently as once a quarter. If it's the right content, if it's valuable to the right audience, you know, you can only do a few pieces a year and it's going to be really, really valuable. So that's the path that I'm going to be walking you through. Uh, Again, influencer, not good or bad, just different strategy, different goals. This is my path. This is some some of the stuff that I've done, um, you know, in my podcast book. I'm in the process of writing a book. Um, I do have an email list that I send emails every week, um, which you'll be part of when you join productvpchallenge.com. That's where I do my articles right now. So there's two audience strategies for brand building. Um, One is internal uh, inside the company. And by the end of like within the next eight minutes, you'll have the, the tools and I'll be asking you to tell me what you're gonna be implementing um, immediately from these, uh, these strategies. And the other one is for more advanced people or more senior people, um, who are wanting to develop their brand outside of the company. So the internal audience strategy, the pros and cons of that is, you know, you saw the numbers, uh, most, most people are consumers. Uh, they don't think like, mm, creators, uh, they don't, think like thought leaders. So chances are that nobody else in your organization or very few people are doing it. So it'll be super easy to stand out with minimal effort. As you strengthen your communication muscle by going through, um, you know, some, some of the strategies I'll teach you, that will directly benefit your career because communication is the single most important predictive factor of success, not just in a tech career, but anywhere, anywhere else, like being able to talk about your product as an entrepreneur, being able to sell your product. It all comes it all comes down to communication. The cons of that is that your professional brand is not really easily transferable between companies, but your relationships will be. And so the people that start perceiving you as a thought leader inside the company, a couple of years down the line, you'll all be working in different places. So uh, there'll be great connections and referrals uh, for you. And some of that brand is going to travel around uh, with them. So the first thing I want you to switch is switch your mindset from, um, you know, seeing all the stakeholders in your company as these horrible obstacles to fight with because, you know, they don't give me what I want or they don't understand why this is important. So you're placing the burden on the stakeholder to kind of, get what's going on and help you and support you. Where in fact, you should be thinking of everybody, including the most difficult stakeholder you can imagine as an audience to be served and engaged. And guess what? As the person serving that audience, it is your responsibility to find the way, the timing, the specific method and format 
in which you can communicate it in a way that they get it, that it can hear you, that it can land with them. So you're not going to just toss any old message across the fence and then complain when nothing happens. You're going to be testing and iterating. You're going to be observing and understanding who needs to be communicated to how, when, what is the right timing, what is the right format, what's the right approach. You want to develop sophistication with each stakeholder understanding what your audience needs. So that's the shift in mindset that you'll have to do. So here we get into specifics. I'm going to be giving you some specific um, prescriptive things here. So pay attention. I'll uh, summarize them at the end, but uh, this is where we're going to go really quickly. It's going to get very specific. So let's see if you can follow. So right now, ch chances are somebody's coming across your desk and is asking you for some expertise or is asking a question that they've been told you can answer. And chances are they're not the only ones doing that. Um, you may get, be getting pinged on Slack or over email about the same topics over and over and over again. So instead of you kind of having to repeat the answer multiple times to different people, I want you to, I want this light bulb to go, I'll go off in your head and you to say, all right, uh, you know what? Uh, let's get you all in the room. <laughs> I'm going to do a workshop. I'm going to present in a one-to-many format. I'm going to do a brown bag or whatever it is. Then we're going to uh, then we're going to uh, upload the recording of that. We're going to record that if it's on Zoom, even better. Then we're going to record upload the recording of that. We can even transcribe it, or I can like do the handout or do a summary of points, upload it on the company wiki. And then guess, the, guess what happens? Anytime somebody has a question like that, they say, hey, check out her, check out this person's, check out, um, you know, her wiki page. She has an article about it. And now you become the expert in that field. It's documented. You have your own, you know, workshop that you did. You have your own article about it. The next thing I want you to start doing is um, <laughs> I want you to, instead of kind of never thinking about, especially if you're on the lower level, not lower levels, meaning more individual contributor levels, um, thinking that it's somebody else's job to figure out the big picture strategy of the company that, you know, it's not really, it's above your pay grade to be thinking about the market and the growth and the vision and the strategy and the competitors, um, because your slice of that is too, too narrow. And um, this has been something I've implemented with great success and something I've done always in the first 90 days of being in a new role in a new company. I want you to sit down and actually envision, imagine that you were given the reins of this company. Tomorrow, the investor said, okay, we fired all the executives. We gave you this company. Now you have to tell us how you would run it. What would you change? What would you invest in? Where do you see the opportunities? Where would you point the future of this company? Um, and then I want you to sit down and actually lay it out and produce your own strategy deck of a few slides with your thoughts on that. By the process of producing that, you'll clear and clarify your own thinking. You'll identify what questions need to be asked. You'll start asking those questions. And don't produce the strategy deck as the my answer to what needs to get done and this is the right answer. Think of it as a conversation starter which is going, and then what I want you to do is share this conversation starter with some of the people around you, with your manager, with some of the stakeholders. Be careful with your manager if they're very insecure. This could really trigger them. So this is for mature ma managers who can take this because this can sometimes be like, whoa, 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 why are you doing that, right? Uh, so be smart who you share it with, but this shared with the right individuals in the company is going to win you huge, huge alliances and people are going to immediately think of you as a strategic thinker. The next thing is pretty tactical and simple, but it's highly effective. Uh, a lot of times you put good ideas and proposals and requests right in the body of an email. Worse, you do it in an email thread or in a Slack thread. And guess what? Email is everybody's kind of noisiest channel. Uh, the brain is just triaging stuff on email. The brain is in a completely different frame of mind when it reads an article or when it reads a piece or a document than when it's going through email. So you don't want your stuff to get lost in the noise, in the shuffle. So what do you do? 
I want you to now identify anything that you want more attention directed to. And instead of stuffing it in an email, put the same words or even better, like, you know, streamline it, make it super succinct and clear, put it in PDF or in an actual document attachment, like a slide deck or a PDF, attach it to the darn email or the calendar invite, because then the person is going to be like, oh, there's an attachment. There's a document here. They're going to read that document in a completely different frame of mind. They're going to give it more attention. And the fact that it's in a document is also going to elevate your status as the creator of that document. I also want you to be develop, cultivate aware presence in meetings. Um, and I want you to stop being passive, thinking that you can only contribute if you know the answer to a question. Instead of that, I want you to understand that one of the biggest ways that you can contribute value is by asking clarifying questions, truly, truly clarifying and curious questions, asking why or asking how or asking you know, what about this other way? Or, hey, what is, you know, what is the other side of this? Um, this can be more valuable and elevate your uh, reputation as a thought leader because, because, um, because you care more about advancing the idea or advising, advancing the thinking inside of the group than you care about being the one to come up with the winning idea, mine my idea, my thing, right? So really understand that your thought leadership extends to influencing the ideation and the decision-making process that's outside of you as well. And you can do that very effectively through asking good questions. Next, I want you to become a curator of resources. So instead of feeling the pressure of always having the answer to everything yourself, I want you to start collecting useful resources. Uh, around your domain and start curating those collections and share those collections with people anytime a question comes up. This also doubles as a great topic for a podcast appearance or a blog post. And in this day and age where information is really a commodity, it's free and available to all, curation is incredibly value added just because we don't have the bandwidth to consume all of the information in its raw form. Um, that's why apps like Blinkist exist and Cliff's Notes or whatever it was, you know, um, all these kind of summarization and highlighting curation efforts. That's a layer of creation as well. I also want you to take advantage of existing internal channels. So especially if you're working at a larger company, um, you probably have things like brand bag series, blogs, podcasts, all hands, etc. So a lot of these comm channels are managed by people internally who are always looking for good content. So go and find out the person who's, you know, running each series and, and, and volunteer to do a post or do a, uh, an episode with them or, you know, provide content, contribute to that channel. They're always looking for good content. If they don't have, if your company doesn't have channels and events, or if you don't like the ones that exist, then, um, Create your own. Start, take the initiative to create and lead a channel. Lead a brown bag series. Start, I started, I've started like um, speaker series, speaker events, workshops. I've even, I even had a meditation series, a med <laughs> meditation event. I used to teach yoga. Um, honestly, I had like a mindfulness series I started. Um, so really your creativity is your limit. So. What is going to happen if you commit to using at least two of these strategies? This is this is this is this is um, some of the results that you will see. I guarantee you, you will level up your communication. You will be tapped for opportunities to present and explain because so few of your colleagues can actually string, you know, a thought together and present it in an articulate way. You will start being seen as an expert, even if you don't feel like one, just because you're in the business of organizing, curating, and thinking more deeply about um, pieces that everybody else is just like, you know, spitting out without any filter. And you'll be top of mind with your stakeholders. So uh, grab, grab, your, <laughs> grab your chat uh, or go and head into your chat right now. And I'm going to start, I'm going to summarize some of those tactics right now here. 
And so I want you to look at the number in front of the tactic and I want you to tell me which numbers. So give me two numbers for the two approaches that you commit to implementing in the next week. And yes, I mean the next week. So by next Friday, you're going to post in the women in product group, like, hey, here's what I did in the last week. Here's the two approaches from uh, the workshop that I implemented. Uh, And these are all scoped to be done within a week. So don't give me like, oh, this is not possible. I don't have time. Number one was set up a one-to-many presentation brown bag talk for a question you often get from different people. Number two was outline a strategy deck. I'm not asking you to do a whole strategy deck. Just create a freaking outline and you can complete the strategy deck in the next 30 days. And after that, show it to at least two people in your company. The outline is for the next week. Number three is put your proposal argument ideas uh, in a PDF attachment. Don't do that for everything. Uh, Do that selectively, but do do that at least once in the next week. In a meeting, focus on asking at least three reflecting, clarifying questions and listen. Number five is curate a list of top resources in your domain. You can also have one on every major topic and share those. Number six is inventory your company's comm channels and volunteer to create content for at least one. Number seven is volunteer to start a comm channel in your organization. So go in the chat right now and uh, drop the two numbers that you're committing to doing in the next week. And there's no option of like, oh, I don't have the time. Nobody has time. Everybody creates time. Karen is going to do three and five. Jamie's going to do two and six. Um, Jen is going to do one and four. Megan uh, is going to do two and four. Two and four for Carolina. Raquel is four and five. Amy is five and six. Uh, Chi Wan, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, four and five. Sheila, f- two and four. Lidor Nubari, four and five. Safina, three and five. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay. So um, very quickly, here's the advanced strategy for external audience. And the pros of that is that your external brand is basically going to be your recruiter. It's going to speak on your behalf and it's going to be your emissary that goes out ahead of you. It's an amazing recruiting tool, as I mentioned. The cons of the strategy is high consequence. Long form original content is really hard to get rid of once on the internet, especially on LinkedIn, right? It's really attached to your profile. LinkedIn newsletter creation. Um, So LinkedIn is really putting in a lot of resources and oomph and they're uh, doing amazing things that are not going to be sustainable. They're not going to last for long, like sending individualized emails with your full length article to the the people who follow your newsletter and who follow your profile. It's like an, it's, it's basically you are getting straight into the inbox of your network, uh, bypassing LinkedIn because they don't even have to log into LinkedIn to read your piece. It's amazing the stuff that, that, that LinkedIn is doing to promote newsletters right now. But currently it's one per profile and all your professional connections are going to be automatically invited to follow your newsletter when you create it. That means all your bosses, all your boss's bosses, all the recruiters, everybody you connected on LinkedIn is going to be invited to subscribe. There's no option around that. So the stakes are high to be on point and put out high quality content. This was my uh, was my newsletters because I uh, stopped uh, writing for it. Now, if you want to get my articles, you have to subscribe to my email newsletter, which is free, and you'll be automatically subscribed after you subscribe and join the Product VP Challenge. Um, Substack or Medium, again, are great for building your email list uh, and eventually monetizing it. Um, building your following. LinkedIn newsletter is what I recommend for you if you're ready for this step because of uh, how aggressive they are trying to take away um, uh, business from Substack and Medium and put it directly on the native LinkedIn newsletter. Um, and it has high consequence, but high, high, the high distribution. The open rates are crazy. When I was uh, posting on LinkedIn on my newsletter, um, I would get something like 40, 50 percent or more opens, which means they're reading my email newsletter straight in their inbox, um, you know, um, all my all my followers and subscribers. 
you need to select your audience and goes very, very carefully. Um, speaking and uh, submitting to speak at industry events is really, really important. Uh, you can practice by recording videos regularly and posting them in your newsletter articles and posts. This builds collateral and gives you practice and confidence. You can prepare a speaking kit, regularly submit speaking proposals and pitches, pitch to be interviewed about podcasts or super, super, super advanced. This is like fifth level advanced, start your own podcast. Uh, this is a high level commitment, a lot of work. What about AI and chatbots? Um, so there's interesting. We, we don't know exactly how they're going to impact, you know, content creation and um, our, you know, ability to create unique content. But according to Chamath Palihapitiya, uh, the AI future uh, will belong to those on the company side with proprietary data sets that can learn and improve through AI. And as individual employees or individuals, um, the future, uh, the most in-demand role he sees uh, as being the AI prompt engineer, because um, there's just, you know, that interface is not being built yet with between us and AI. And now, depending on how you ask the chatbot, um, you're going to get a completely different answer, like depending on what you prompt it with. So what that means is that your brand, your brand will not depend, and it doesn't already, but it will become even less dependent on your actual knowledge. Um, but it will start depending more about uh, on your ability to curate, organize, interpret, and put your own point of view on things, right? Have that own unique voice among the endless sea of data. To have a strong professional brand, uh, there are two prerequisites, very, very important, uh, is you need to get clear on your three to five-year career vision, values, and passion, uh, the topics where you want to be an expert in, and you need to be clear on your six to 12-month career plan. Um, this is a big focus on why I created the Product VP Challenge. Again, please, you know, join us. You can attend some of the sessions live, some of the sessions by replay. It's free. We kick off tomorrow productvpchallenge.com. And that's the reason why, you know, my executive uh, development program, my um, Denali executive development program has had such great success because this is a missing piece for a lot, a lot of professionals. Once you have that foundation, then and only then we will be able to understand who your audience is, pick your themes and topics, set up your editorial calendar and content creation cadence, pipeline of topics, um, your tasks, breaking them down, and blocking time off into uh, time boxes. So that's it. Super easy, right? Um, oh, wait. <laughs> if you want to go deeper and get help with all the foundational stuff that I talked about, I'll see you at the productvpchallenge.com. So go right now, productvpchallenge.com. Um, you know, put Put, put your email in, uh, click submit, and you'll be on my email list. And you'll also have the chance to go deeper with some of those topics. So I'm going to stop sharing right now, pop myself out of here. And, um, you know, I, I'm sorry I went a little bit over. <laughs> Jamie, I'll turn this back over to you. And um, if you, I know that there's going to be a survey, but it would mean a lot to me if you also drop in the chat how valuable was this to you, uh, this workshop to you on a scale of one to 10. I'd love to see that. Jamie, over to you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that very inspiring presentation. Uh, yes, the presentation will be sent out um, by the organizers after this session. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A tab. In the meantime, uh, I have a question for Lisa. Um, yes. How to, you know, I feel like you talked about trying to grow your confidence, and this is one of the ways that you did so. Um, how do you come up with the confidence to even like go out there and put yourself out there? Yeah. Um, well, you start small and you know, that's both the blessing and the curse of starting, you know, from scratch, because in the beginning, 
your audience will be very small. You know, when you share something, maybe you share it with a colleague or a peer or your manager, if they're supportive or, or a friend or, you know, a couple of people at work, uh, an event, and that will build confidence. You will get good feedback. Uh, you'll iterate, and then you'll have the courage to get deeper, way deeper into the pool. So don't throw yourself off the deep end. Um, even, you know, even submitting to speak a woman in product is not throwing yourself off the deep end because the submission itself, you know, is, you know, a piece of content. You can get, you know, you can get some nice feedback. And the fact that you did it is already going to put you in the mindset of adopting the identity of a writer and a speaker. Writers and speakers write and speak. They are not always perfect. They have to put in a lot of hours in working on their craft. So the sooner you start doing the things that will help your mind identify yourself, oh, I'm a writer, I'm a speaker, I'm a thought leader, I'm a content creator, um, you'll get more motivation and more confidence to stick with it. And again, in the beginning, uh, your audience is going to be small. You're not going to have a huge following. If you start your newsletter, it's going to be, uh, you know, well, unless you start on LinkedIn where they really push everyone to follow you. But, you know, if you start your audience in the beginning is going to be very, very small. When I first started my podcasts, my first, you know, 20, 30 episodes, I mean, I'm not even going back there. I sound very, very different. I found my voice right around episode 80 or 90. And uh, by then I had a much bigger audience. So it kind of goes hand in hand. Your audience will develop. You will get better. You'll also get faster and more efficient at creating the content. Um, in the beginning, it might be a bit slower going. Yeah. I see a question now. Amy P. asks, does sharing come naturally to you? What inspired you to start contributing on Quora? especially yeah. when you were feeling a lack of validation. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, it, it was partly because I wasn't having validation right around me. It was like I was looking for community. I was looking for someone to tell me I was doing a good job. I was looking for someone to tell me that what I had to offer was meaningful and valuable and 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 worthy of, you know, was, was helping someone uh, because I didn't get that in my immediate circle and everybody else expected me to inspire them and lead them. And I'm like, wait, what about me? <laughs> so, um, and then the other part was, so I was looking for, for validation, but I've been, I've always enjoyed writing. I've always enjoyed, um, and I pushed myself to speak because I don't know why, but because I really wanted to prove to myself that I could be a speaker, even though I stuttered. Um, and so I, you know, I um, even in high school, I would apply to speak at the graduation and I was actually selected to be the graduation speaker. And some years later, I went back, they invited me to be the keynote graduation speaker because the president of the country couldn't attend. <clears throat> That's my other claim to fame. Seriously, the president canceled. They needed a last minute keynote speaker and hello. <laughs> so you know, you have to, I think in life and in, uh, in your career, like you can't take yourself or you can't take criticism too seriously. You have to be able to brush things off. I mean, some of the scary stories, I'm sure this room is full of them that I've heard from uh, my clients and our coaching programs that I've myself seen or heard. I mean, it would make everybody's skin crawl. And if you believe those horrible comments or horrible put downs or somebody else's insecurities projected onto you, you're not going to last long. And life is way too short to pay attention to, to those. So you have to be able to develop um, this ability to potentially be embarrassed, potentially fail, potentially have spinach in your teeth as you're talking. I mean, you know, and be okay with it recover gracefully. Because when you do, you'll prove to yourself that nothing can take you down. You're going to be fine. You're going to be okay no matter what. So it's developing this, uh, the ability to be resilient and the ability to know that you're safe no matter what. And putting yourself in the danger zone, exposing yourself like that. And believe me, LinkedIn is not the same as Facebook. You're not going to get a bunch of haters on LinkedIn. Because everybody's there with their profiles, so they're not going to be trolling you on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great platform to be creating content because everybody's so polite and professional. 
Uh, awesome. That rolls very well into Renee's question, which is how do you work through the criticism and negativity everyone is bound to experience when they publish on the internet? Well, that's why you don't do it. Remember, I said LinkedIn newsletter, big warning signs. I had this flashing thing. I didn't even say go on Facebook or go on, you know, all these other platforms. I didn't go do a Reddit thread. <laughs> Um, that's why I'm saying you have to start where it's safe. You have to start, you know, small, you have to start with the, with the people that you feel safe with, which are some trusted colleagues and people in your organization, somebody you start on with, you know, smaller audiences, one-on-one settings, uh, you know, small brown bag, a small, you know, workshop, a small presentation here and there. You start in your company. Nobody says like, go out there from zero to like 60 and five seconds and go straight to posting a huge post on Facebook that's going to get a bunch of trolls and haters. Um, no, I'm not even saying even do that at all. Like the super advanced stages start posting things on LinkedIn. And as I mentioned, LinkedIn, I haven't found anybody trolling anybody on LinkedIn. I haven't found anybody saying anything bad on LinkedIn because everything's connected to your profile. You don't want to be mean on LinkedIn. Everybody wants to be nice and networking on LinkedIn. So you're not going to get, unless you wade into politics, religion, um, or something else, which you stay like super far away from. Please like don't. Don't mix like any of that toxic, you know, nuclear topic stuff in your writing, especially early on. Stick to your domain, stick to like what's happening there. Be like, be interested and interesting, you know. Um, you're not going to get a bunch of haters. <laughs> you're not. Believe me. Um, this is not about exposure. This is about um, value add and ideas and knowledge. Wonderful, wonderful um, suggestion to start small, stay safe. Uh, LinkedIn yeah. is a really good place to start. I see a question from Benet mm -hmm. um, about, uh, you know, internally at your own company, you can make time to invest on initiatives and build your brand and build your thought leadership. Mm -hmm. um, but the tactics for external actions are a lot of work and a lot mm -hmm. of time. How do you balance family, work, mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. fitness, and <laughs> time in content yes. creation? Yes, yes. So all writers will tell you this. And the book I recommend to everybody is called Deep Work. Um, and he talks about that uh, as, as well. You have to, you won't find time. You won't find time. You have to create time. And that means, but you have to create time in manageable chunks. So a lot of writers have, maximum an hour they actually some of them work in shorter spurts like half an hour 45 minutes and they keep that it becomes like a sacred date they have with themselves keep it clear on the calendar and they just sit down and your output initially will be low will be small but output will increase as your skill increases your frequency increases it's just like any habit you'll start getting better at it so you're not going to get time you're not going to find time you have to create time and what's going to happen is if you prioritize working on things that are important but not urgent like this is um, you'll be able to start saying no easier to things that are trying to get into your space that are urgent but not important because you'll be like <laughs> This stuff doesn't, doesn't really matter. Like how many times have you found that you go on vacation and something blows up while you're away, you come back and you see the like 25 piece email thread and it's blown over. It's resolved. It's fine. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't require your attention, your involvement, anything. It's blown over. So you can do the same. You can let certain things burn in the background because they're not going to burn down the house. Because you're going to be working on the stuff that will build you. You're going to be working on things that are going to benefit your five-year future self instead of staying on the hamster wheel. So it actually will make you more strategic in all areas of your life if you prioritize um, you know, strategic content creation in your immediate calendar. It's a matter of priorities. If you want something, you'll find a way to make it happen. You find a way to make it happen. We are so lucky and privileged, all of us. I mean, we don't have to, 
walk five miles to water. If any of you have been to Africa and have seen like what some people have to do just to go through like daily life, you're going to be like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I have so much time on my disposal um, in the grand scheme of things, right? So awesome. Um, so we have a couple of minutes. Do we want to do blenders? I'll stay around to get matched up with someone. Absolutely. Uh, yes. So we're going to now go to the one-on-one uh, -on -one networking. So if you all click on the networking tab on your left side, uh, Lisa and I will be joining. So we hope to see you there. Uh, and remember, join Lisa's, ch uh, Lisa's challenge yeah. and uh, do the two things that you committed to doing. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow.